This happened to me on July 17, 1993. I was staying at a buddy's cabin up in rural Maine. Beautiful, dense woods, the kind where the trees blot out the sun at midday. He needed help with repairs, and I was always up for some time away from the city. My name's Harris. One morning, I went for a hike in the woods. Deep in those parts, you don't find trails or nothing, just you and the trees. Had my pack, a walking stick, my dad's old hunting knife at my belt. I was used to the wild, but still, always best to be prepared. Something felt off after a couple hours of walking. Too quiet. No birds, no critters rustling in the bushes. You get used to the sounds, or the absence of them. I stopped and listened, that sixth sense you develop in nature starting to prickle. Then I heard a snap of a twig behind me. I spun around. At first, I saw nothing, just the shadows and the thick tangle of trees. Then it stepped into a clearing, about thirty feet away. It was massive, bipedal, easily seven feet tall and covered in long, matted brown fur. The head was, I still struggled to find the words. Almost like a wolf, but misshapen, the muzzle stretched out and the jaw hung slack. It tilted its head, and I saw the eyes. Blood red, pure and unblinking. I froze, one hand reaching slowly for the knife. I didn't know if I could run, if it would chase. I didn't want to find out. We stood there for what felt like hours, me and this unnatural beast locked in some silent staring contest. The air felt heavy, charged. Every muscle in my body tensed, ready to run or fight, or be killed. Then, without warning, it let out a low, guttural growl a sound that crawled under my skin and settled in my stomach like a cold stone. And then it was gone, disappearing into the trees with shocking speed for something its size. I don't know how long I stood there shaking. When I could finally move, I headed back for the cabin, walking fast, not looking behind me. That night, I told my buddy, his name was Caleb, what I'd seen. Figured he'd laugh. He was from up there, had to know some local legend matching the description. He didn't laugh. Got real serious, looked out into the night, chewing his lip. Took a long swig of beer before he spoke. Folks around here, some know the old stories passed down. Think it's all made up tales. Cept, every now and then, something happens. Hunter goes missing. Cattle mutilated. Sightings in the deep woods. They call it the dogman. Dogman, I echoed, more of a breath than a word. It sounded like something from a bad horror movie. But looking at Caleb's pale face, there was no mistaking the fear beneath the bravado. Ain't nothing natural about it, that's for sure. Some kind of spirit, maybe. Or a something else. I don't mess around in them woods at night, that's all I'm saying. The next few days were tense. We stuck together, kept the guns loaded, and didn't venture far. Then, on our last night, Caleb decided to throw a small campfire party out back, couple of his other buddies coming over. It was stupid, I know, but we were trying to blow off steam, act like things were normal. I even managed a laugh or two. But that primal fear never truly left, and as the night deepened, it bubbled back to the surface stronger than ever. Around midnight, we heard a crash from the tree line, followed by a scream. One of Caleb's friends, a girl named Tessa. We all scrambled to our feet, guns ready. Caleb swore, grabbed a flashlight, and charged toward the noise. I followed, heart pounding like a drum in my chest. When we reached the edge of the woods, Caleb's light swept the darkness. At first, all I saw were fallen branches and Tessa, curled on the ground and crying. 
We rushed over to her. Then I saw the blood. And the track's huge footprints, not human, not bare, something that walked on two legs but had claws that dug deep into the earth. Caleb turned, face illuminated by the flashlight beam, and for the first time, I saw real terror in his eyes. We didn't need to say it. The dogman was back. We got Tessa inside, locked the doors, and huddled in the living room with the lights blazing. I didn't know what else to do but grip the shotgun by the fireplace and try to stay calm, knowing it was probably useless. The rest of the night was filled with noises. Growls, the rasping of something heavy against the cabin walls, thuds on the roof. Every second felt like an hour, the terror slowly choking the life out of us. By dawn, the sounds had faded. We waited, every nerve on edge, until the sun dipped above the trees. Only then did Caleb dare open the door. His face was grim, etched with sleepless exhaustion and cold terror. Tessa's car was nowhere to be seen. We ventured out cautiously, following the tracks that led away from the cabin and back into the depths of the woods. They stopped abruptly a few hundred yards in, no sign of a struggle, no more blood. Just an uncanny feeling of emptiness, like whatever had been there was simply, gone, vanished back into the wilderness from whence it came. We stumbled back to the cabin, shell-shocked and desperate to get as far away from that place as possible. We reported Tessa as missing. The police questioned us, thoroughly confused by our descriptions of the tracks, the noises we'd heard. Animal attack was the official explanation, though anyone who glanced at Caleb's face knew even he didn't quite believe that. They searched the woods, of course, but found nothing. Tessa became another name on those missing posters you see at gas stations, fading into a statistic. Caleb moved away shortly after. Couldn't blame him. The dogman had broken something in him tarnished the childhood innocence he still clung to. I never saw him again, never even heard from him. Figured he changed his name, disappeared into some city, tried to forget what lurked in those main woods. I stuck around longer. Didn't make sense, except that stubborn part of me wanted answers. I studied local lore, read those old newspaper clippings about strange deaths and disappearances. Turns out, tales of the dogmen were as old as the town itself. And they all seemed to follow a strange pattern, a cluster of sightings, a missing person, then silence. For decades sometimes, I became obsessed, consumed with trying to understand the creature, to predict its return. I armed myself to the teeth, spent nights wandering the woods, armed with my old hunting rifle and a growing arsenal of increasingly high-powered weaponry. Never slept more than a few hours at a time, constantly alert, constantly braced for attack. It became my own private war in those shadowed woods. People thought I was crazy. The town outcast, the nutter who whispered about monsters others pretended weren't real. Maybe they were right. Maybe in my pursuit of the truth, I lost something essential in myself. Then, a few years later, it came back. Reports started trickling in. A slaughtered deer carcass, found in a way that no wolf or mountain lion would have left it. Hikers on the outskirts of town, hearing noises in the trees, swearing they were being watched. And that creeping sense of unease settling over the entire area once again. One night, I woke in my rundown trailer to the sound of scratching at the door. I knew it before I even reached for the rifle. When I looked out the window, those red eyes gleamed back, reflecting the moonlight. The dogman had returned. And this time, I was ready. The fight was indescribable. A blur of fur and teeth, the crack of rifle shots, the thick, coppery smell of blood that wasn't mine. At some point I lost the gun, ending up on my back, 
wrestling those impossibly strong claws away from my throat. It was pure animal instinct, fueled by years of fear and hatred. It ended with my dad's hunting knife buried up to the hilt in its chest. Not a clean kill. It howled, shuddered, then lay still. The eyes, once filled with predatory fire, dimmed and then went lifeless. And for the first time, I got a good, close look at what I'd been fighting. It was horrific. Not just animal, but not fully, anything I recognized. Like a grotesque experiment gone wrong, a twisted mockery of life itself. A wave of nausea swept over me, the adrenaline crash leaving me trembling with disgust and fear. When the sheriff and the park rangers arrived, drawn by the gunshots, all that was left was the body. They didn't believe my story, of course. Took me in for questioning, checked me into a psych ward for a while. I didn't fight it. Letting them believe I was unstable meant they'd leave me alone. I stayed in town, despite it all. Couldn't stomach the thought of running away like Caleb did. This was my fight now. I became the keeper of the secret, the protector against the thing in the shadows. People still saw me as the crazy guy, and maybe I was. But they slept safe in their houses, unaware of the true horrors lurking just beyond the reach of their porch lights. Some nights, I still walk the woods, keeping watch. The dogman, or whatever it was, never came back. At least, not that I've seen. But I know one thing for sure. The next time the whispers of disappearances and strange sightings start, the next time that old fear prickles at the back of the town's neck, I'll be there, waiting. This happened to me in October of 1997. I live off-grid in an old, simple cabin in the Chattahoochee National Forest here in Georgia. The place is remote. It suits me well. I'm Randall Moss. Folks call me Randy. I hunt, I fish, and I mostly keep to myself. I've made friends with some of the nearby locals, though, and that includes the sheriff, Donnell Brooks. We'll grab a beer when I head into town for supplies. One evening, Donnell showed up at my door late, which was unusual. He was out of breath, agitated. Randy, he said, we need your help. A father and son on a weekend camping trip went missing up near Springer Mountain. We've been searching the trails all day, but we need someone who knows these woods the way you do. I grabbed my rifle. I figured a couple of city folks probably just wandered off course. Happens all the time. I didn't hesitate to join the search effort. We headed into the woods, flashlights cutting through the dusk. I took point, guiding Donnell and a couple of his deputies. The night thickened quickly. Leaves crunched underfoot. The forest whispered with the wind and night creatures skittering around us. The searchlights did little against the inky dark. Their campsite looked normal, said Donnell. We found the dad's wallet right there in the tent. No sign of a struggle. That's odd, I said. I found their tracks leading away from the campsite, but something seemed wrong. We followed, the ground rising beneath our feet as we began our ascent of the mountain. Donald's radio crackled. Unit 2, any sign of them? A voice echoed back. Nothing over here, Sheriff. Keep searching, Donnell said. Stay in pairs over. After a couple more hours, the tracks we were following simply vanished on a stony outcropping. It was as if the father and son disappeared into thin air. We continued searching, but it felt like a fruitless chase after ghosts. By midnight I knew we had to call it off. Dawn would bring fresh eyes, more searchers. Donnell looked stricken with the responsibility. 
his voice barely above a whisper. What the hell happened out here, Randy? I didn't have an answer for him. There was just an uneasy feeling prickling at the back of my neck. Back at my cabin, sleep wouldn't come. I paced the floorboards, rifle clutched in my hand. It didn't make sense. Those tracks disappearing like that. A prickle of unease ran down my spine. I stepped out onto the porch. The full moon cast strange patterns across the forest floor, shadows playing tricks on my eyes. Then I saw a movement a flicker of something massive and dark by the tree line. My heart began hammering in my chest. I raised my rifle, finger tight on the trigger, straining to see. Then the eyes... They glowed back at me in the moonlight, two burning orbs. Massive, impossibly high above the ground. The creature, whatever it was, was huge. I could make out a bulky shape, thick legs, impossibly long arms dangling, claws gleaming in the darkness. I'd never seen anything like it. You see that? Donald's voice was strained, barely louder than a whisper. He and the deputies emerged from the cover of the trees and stood beside me, staring with wide eyes at the hulking shape. A low, guttural growl echoed through the clearing, making my blood run cold. The creature took a slow, deliberate step toward us. Fire! Donnell shouted. A series of gunshots echoed through the night. The creature flinched and let out an ear-splitting shriek but it kept coming. Donnell and his deputies fired again, the bullets making small thuds against its thick hide with seemingly no effect. Donnell stumbled backward, falling on his backside. I knew we were outmatched. I bolted through the trees, Donnell and his deputies scrambling behind me. We didn't stop until we stumbled out onto the main road, all of us heaving for breath. We looked back. The glowing eyes were gone, swallowed by the darkness. What in the hell? What was that? One of the deputies stammered, his face pale with shock. Donnell took a deep breath. I, I don't know. The next few days were chaotic. Search and rescue teams scoured the forest. The news crews descended. They never found a trace of the missing campers. I didn't tell them about the creature. They wouldn't have believed me, and likely thought me crazy. Instead, I gave them vague shrugs, saying the missing men could have wandered off anywhere. Since that night, I keep watch from my porch. I haven't seen a sign of the creature again, but I feel it out there. Watching. Waiting. It's changed the way I live in these woods. I'm always armed always looking over my shoulder. Donnell and I don't talk about what happened that night. I woke up that morning with an eagerness to hunt. My name is Clyde Henderson, and although I'm an accountant by trade, my true passion lies in connecting with nature and pursuing game. The location for today's excursion was Thompson's Woods, a dense forest located in northern Vermont, United States. The landscape of Thompson's Woods is mesmerizing, with tall trees reaching for the sky and the ground blanketed in fallen leaves. Streams snake through the underbrush, providing a source of water for the abundant wildlife. It was the perfect hunting spot. As I made my way deeper into the woods, rifle in hand, I recalled last night's phone call with my brother. We had exchanged stories about our teenage years, how we would skip school to sneak away into nature. It felt good reminiscing on those days. Continuing through the woods, I happened upon a gruesome sight. Blood splattered across foliage like modern art. Stunned, I stood there questioning what sort of animal could cause such carnage. If there's one thing hunting has taught me over the years, 
it's that nature can often be cruel and unforgiving. Hesitantly, I trailed the blood further into the woods. Along the path, I noticed strange footprints with claw marks embedded into the soil. Growing more intrigued and wary with each step, my heart rate began to rise. Another hunter, Sam Jacobson, approached me from roughly fifty yards away. We exchanged knowing glances and quickly agreed that something ominous was lurking nearby. Clyde, Sam whispered, eyes locked on the ground where I pointed out the footprints and blood stains we found earlier. I've never seen anything like this before. Neither have I. I replied thoughtfully as we proceeded cautiously, rifles primed and ready for whatever may come our way. Soon enough, we stumbled upon something far more puzzling, a shallow pit filled with animal remains. From what we could make out, these were the carcasses of freshly killed deer. Suddenly, a chilling thought crossed my mind. What kind of creature would have enough strength and cunning to take down multiple deer, yet leave their remains untouched? Sam patted my shoulder, attempting to lighten the mood. Hey, he joked weakly. You think there's a chance we've found Bigfoot's lunch? As intriguing as it would have been to be the one who discovered Bigfoot, I highly doubted he was our culprit. We pressed on, determination fueling our every step. Cautiously following the trail, we stumbled upon something we couldn't begin to comprehend, a nightmarish beast feasting on its prey. This creature was unlike anything we had encountered before, its massive body supported by elongated limbs ending in razor-sharp claws. We froze in place as it turned to face us, its overwhelming presence engulfing our senses. A snarl escaped its grotesque mouth as it seemed to gauge if we too were worth devouring. I glanced at Sam and whispered shakily, Run! Suddenly the woods erupted into chaos as Sam and I fled from the creature's blood-curdling roars. With adrenaline surging through our veins, we navigated through the trees, trying to put distance between ourselves and the thing that hunted us. As we continued our desperate escape from this monstrous entity, a single shot rang out. Sam slumped onto the forest floor almost instantaneously. My heart sank as I realized he had fallen victim to our own gunfire in the midst of our panicked escape. I wanted to help Sam, but I knew that there was no logical chance I could save him while the creature was hunting us. Instead, I made for a nearby tree and quickly climbed it, finding branches strong enough to support my weight. In this precarious position— I saw no way of calling for help and attracting the attention of the beast. My mind was racing. I needed to find a way to get out of this harrowing situation alive. After what seemed like an eternity, the creature eventually retreated into the shadows, leaving Sam's lifeless body behind. It disappeared as discreetly as it had come into our lives, bringing with it an eerie silence that filled the woods. As soon as I felt safe enough to climb down from my refuge, I rushed over to Sam and desperately tried to administer first aid. However, it appeared evident that my efforts were in vain. He had departed this world without warning or a chance at salvation. Amidst tears and overwhelming grief, I began dragging Sam's body back toward our camp. Each step felt heavier than the last as reality sunk in. My dear friend was gone forever. As I reached camp, exhaustion took hold of me. The sun started to set and with no means of communication with the outside world nor knowledge of how to make my way back without getting lost or encountering that horrifying creature once more, my only option was to wait until daybreak before attempting anything else. Daylight finally arrived, and with a heavy heart— I decided my best course of action would be to try and retrace our steps back towards the main road where we had started our ill-fated venture into these cursed woods. Before leaving camp, I hastily prepared a makeshift burial for Sam under a nearby tree. 
while shoveling dirt onto him solemnly whispered goodbye, knowing that he deserved so much better than this. Grief overwhelmed me every moment, but only fueled my determination to escape the woods alive. As I continued back towards the main road, my thoughts revolved around the gruesome and unfathomable events that had transpired. What kind of creature could exist in this world that elicits such fear and agony? Its twisted physique, terrifying roar, and seemingly insatiable appetite remained in my mind as I tried to rationalize its existence. My journey back felt like a lifetime, with every sound causing me to startle and fear for my life. I moved carefully through the foliage, trying my best to remain hidden from whatever predator was lurking there. Traveling at a snail's pace thinking it would be the safest way possible, I finally saw civilization peeking through the trees. The sight of cars passing by on the main road was a bittersweet reminder of the routine life I once knew. Once safely out of the woods, I flagged down a passing driver who kindly gave me a lift to the nearest town. The townspeople were understandably shocked at my disheveled appearance as I tried to recount my experience in a way they might comprehend. One older man listened intently before speaking up. He had heard whispers of similar incidents occurring in those woods in years past but never knew anyone who had come face to face with such a creature and survived. While he couldn't provide any definitive answers about its origins or purpose, his words did nothing but confirm what I suspected, that it was not something from our known natural world. Though my ordeal was over, the weight of what had happened would stay with me forever. Sam's tragic death, our horrific encounter with an unknown beast, and feeling utterly helpless against a horrifying force outside of human understanding— I knew no one could fully understand what I had experienced nor empathize with my emotions. Despite this tragic loss, it became clear that moving forward was essential for survival. Life must go on, not only for me but also in memory of Sam, who had sacrificed himself so unexpectedly and tragically for what could only be described as a series of unfortunate events. I spent the rest of my days searching for answers to identify the horrifying creature that claimed my friend's life. While I never truly found solace, the pursuit of understanding became my life's dedication, knowing that it was the best way I could honor the friend who had been torn away from me in our darkest hour by an unknown entity. A couple years back, I took this trip down near the southern Appalachians. Solo hiking, three nights out in the backcountry. This wasn't strictly for fun, more of a test run for survival techniques. No fancy gear, just the basics. Part of me misses the old army days, you know? I don't do that stuff anymore, got a job with the county but when my old buddy calls and suggests an extreme weekend out in the woods, well, it's hard to say no. My name's Everett, by the way. We drive down with all our stuff packed, find a quiet trail leading off an almost abandoned forestry road. It's late August, still blazing hot in the Carolinas. Thick forest gives a bit of respite. The ground is littered with pine needles, my buddy Clay talks the whole hike, gripes about his boss, complains about some local issue, the regular civilian life problems. Can't blame him. Guess a part of me misses venting over beers, too. It's always different out here, though. Everything fades except finding the next patch of shade and getting enough water. Finally, a few hours in, we hit a creek clear and flowing fast. That's the campsite just off the trail. Clay seems impressed I found such a perfect spot. Truth is, the map gave this place away from the get-go. We split up camp chores, him on collecting kindling for a fire while I purify water and rig up shelter for the night. It's familiar work, 
almost comforting. It gets dark quick when the woods thicken up like this. Clay makes a decent fire, but the crackling seems too loud in the emptiness. That's when it catches my ear. Sounds almost like chanting, but far off. We're miles from anything, shouldn't be hearing anyone else. Clay looks over at me. You hear that? He asks. I nod, trying to make sense of it. Not really words, more like a rhythmic drone, rising and falling in unison. The hell, Clay mumbles, a hint of unease in his voice. But I'm focused on something else. I pick up a scent like rotting meat mixed with wet fur. The firelight cuts a circle in the woods, but all around is dense blackness. Then a sound comes from directly across the creek, a loud snap that echoes. A shape moves with incredible speed, too fast to be any real animal. We scramble to our feet, grabbing our packs. We need to get back to the road. Something isn't right. Maybe Clay is right to be uneasy after all. As if it hears our movements, the thing steps into the flickering light. We hardly get a glimpse. Tall, hunched, almost hairless skin stretched against thin limbs. Pale eyes, wide and staring back at us. Clay makes a choking noise and I yell for him to move. It doesn't attack right away, just lets out this hissing gurgle. It raises a clawed hand. I stumble back and trip over a rock, dropping my pack. In that instant, it lunges. The world turns into a haze of pain. It happens quick. A clawed hand slashes my side, searing through my shirt. I hear Clay scream, feel a heavy blow to my shoulder. There's a crunch as something bites into my thigh, almost severs it, and there's blood everywhere. Then Clay hits the thing from behind with a large branch, driving it back into the dark. I try to crawl but pass out for a moment there in the dirt. Clay hauls me up and back toward the trail, half carrying me. The thing circles us, but it doesn't close in again. I can practically taste its putrid smell in the air and hear it scrabbling through the underbrush. Clay gets hysterical, shouting into the darkness throwing sticks, doesn't accomplish anything. Still, my buddy pulls me to safety step by step. Hours drag on as we somehow follow the path back under cover of night. All the while, that haunting rhythm continues, seeming to keep pace with every pounding heartbeat. It might as well be following us. As the sky starts to turn gray, we stumble onto the dirt road. There's a pickup truck parked right off the asphalt some old guy out fishing this early. When he sees our state, bloodied and ripped up. His face looks like he's seen a ghost. Clay shouts about us needing help. The man goes white. The old guy helps us into the truck and drives into town. It's all emergency rooms and panicked explanations from that point. There's talk of feral dogs, but I don't buy it. They stitch me up, give Clay tetanus shots and antibiotics. We're shaken to the core, both of us. Clay talks about calling the ranger station, describing what we saw. Telling some crazy-sounding story about an unknown wild creature. After a couple of days recovering, he starts to sound serious about reporting it. I grab his arm. I look at his face. Something about how haunted he seems. That was no dog, and whatever was back there in those woods is better left alone. He stares back at me. Nods slowly. It stays our secret. My scars fade. No police incident reports. No investigation. I can walk with a limp now. That's what counts. Clay's doing better too, mostly. His voice still trembles sometimes when we talk. We stick to regular hikes, well-marked trails only. I catch my breath whenever I get a whiff of something rotten. A few nights back, I thought I heard a low chanting echoing down the street when I got off work. 
Just my stupid imagination, that's all. Or at least that's what I try to convince myself. After all, they never really came for us before, did they? No reason to come looking now. Just the way of those creatures. Those skinwalkers, maybe it's best to forget them. Forget those things exist. It's the only way I'll sleep soundly again. A few years back, I took one of those ancestry DNA tests. You know, the kind that sends you pie charts and promises long-lost cousins? That's how I found out about the cabin. Deep in the Ozark Mountains, on some acreage my great-great-something owned way before Missouri was even a state. Seemed strange, as everyone on my mom's side landed in Ellis Island in the 1920s, but hey, free trip to the woods? Why not? My name is Cal, by the way. Short for Caliban, but don't get any ideas. My folks weren't English professors, just fans of old sci-fi flicks. Life as Caliban hasn't exactly been easy, so a week alone in a rustic cabin seemed like therapy the insurance companies wouldn't cover. The old place took two buses and a five-mile hike to reach. Not a soul around, and the forest felt so thick you could practically chew the air. It was exactly what I needed, or thought I did. Second night in, though, I start hearing noises. Rumbling noises, big enough they sent tremors through the old floorboards. Earthquake? I thought, but hey, this is Missouri, not LA Night 3, the noise is back. Now I'm sure something's out there. Bigfoot? Some escaped lunatic? My mind races through every scary backwoods movie I've ever half-watched on cable. Finally, curiosity and my trusty hunting rifle went out over common sense. There's nothing around to give off light besides the moon, casting long, distorted shadows of the trees. Even the crickets shut up when that rumbling sound rolls through the clearing again. This time I make out a shape, dark against the darkness, hulking on two legs. Taller than an elk. But those were four points I saw against the sky when it reared up, not antlers. Something snaps inside me, more adrenaline than fear. Maybe a little too much of the cheap bourbon I brought to make the solitude bearable. I lever a shell in and fire a shot. Roars louder than the gunshot echo back, and with a flash of movement that shouldn't have been possible, that shape streaks toward the cabin. I barely get the door slammed in time. Something heavy slams against it, once, twice. Wood cracks, but holds. That, whatever it is, scrabbles over the roof, making the shingles clatter. This wouldn't look out of place in a zombie movie, some twisted thing desperate to get at the tasty brains inside. Then silence, except for the pounding of my own blood in my ears. Dawn doesn't come fast enough. Finally, with enough light, I edge past the ruined door and out. The yard is torn up, like a giant bulldozer with claws went wild. There's stuff here too. Blood spatter, bright crimson against the moss and bits of cloth snagged on broken branches. No idea if they're mine or part of whatever that monstrous beast was. My hands shake too hard to follow any real trail, even if I'd wanted to. Now, you'd think that's when I'd hike my tail out of there and forget about lost ancestors. But part of me just needed to know. And hey, I still had five days before the bus came back. What's the old saying, better the devil you know? Besides, I always hated leaving unfinished business. Just ask my ex. I spent that day fortifying the cabin, barricades on the windows, dragging heavy furniture against weak spots. There were more supplies here than a weekend vacation should call for. Old axes, bundles of twine, an oil lamp. 
seemed my ancestors got nervous and stocked up after something rattled them a while back. Night comes again. Maybe that was the point I should have given in. But you know how it is, right? It's the anticipation that really gnaws at your guts. So I set up camp on the roof, rifle across my lap, eyes straining into the night. Maybe this was one bad breakup my usual wisecracks couldn't fix. The rumbling comes again, softer at first, like approaching thunder. And then it steps into the moonlight. It was gaunt, skin so tight I could see ribs through the patchy fur. Arms too long, fingers ending in hooked claws. And that face, like a wolf, if a mad scientist built it for war instead of hunting deer. Yellow eyes gleamed as it raised its head, sniffing the air like it caught my scent on the breeze. And that was when I saw its back, scarred, humped in a way that looked all wrong. This thing walked upright, but there was no denying a horrible twist in its spine. We both froze for a second, and then it went berserk, leaping across the yard in a single bound, tearing up dirt. Something shrieked deep inside it, not an animal but a mangled version of a human voice. I took aim, fired. That only seemed to piss it off more. It charged, scaled the side of the cabin with those claws, a grotesque parody of a mountain climber. Somehow, the old roof held. Barely. Through the night we circled, me firing rounds to keep it at bay while its howls shook the whole darn forest. By morning, my ammo was gone, and we were both ragged with exhaustion. It slunk off behind the trees, glaring with those horrible eyes. Maybe it thought I was done for. Maybe that was the game with this creature. To wear you down until you stopped fighting back. I stumbled inside, collapsed, and slept deeper than I had in years. I came to the sound of voices, gruff, shouting with fear, but unmistakably human. Through the boarded-up window I saw three guys staring up at the roof, guns leveled. Turns out my nightly fireworks show drew curious locals. They filled me in after they saw the state of the place there'd been tales of, the beast, haunting those woods for ages. Attacks on livestock, campers vanishing, I just got unlucky enough to have that thing stalk me right home. I'm out of that nightmare now. Back to city crowds and sirens, which sound pretty peaceful after something like that. Never looked too deep into what kind of monster I battled there. The guys called it a skinwalker, Native American lore, I think. Evil spirit walking around wearing an animal hide. Whatever name you put on it, I hope to hell it stays the heck away from whatever address is on my driver's license from now on. March 18th, 2011 Found a piece of land way out in the Idaho backcountry and figured that was as good a place as any to settle down. Call me Jake. Ex-military, bounced between odd jobs after getting discharged. Figured living off the grid was the best way to get some peace and quiet, put those skills to use. The cabin was a fixer-upper, but it had good bones. I spent the first few months patching holes, building a proper outhouse, the basics. Explored the area too, dense pine forests cut through by ravines, an old creek snaking through the property. The locals in the nearest town weren't too friendly to a newcomer, but I was used to keeping to myself. Then the cattle started disappearing. Ranchers in the area found their herds with half-eaten carcasses scattered around. Some blamed wolves or coyotes, but the way the animals were butchered didn't add up. One night, I was working late fixing up the porch when I heard a low growl from the tree lean. Shined my flashlight out there, but didn't see anything. My survival instincts kicked in, that old feeling of being watched from the shadows. 
A few days later, I found Jedediah, the rancher whose land bordered mine. He was face down in the creek, torn apart like something savage had been at him. The sheriff came out, took some photos, and chalked it up to a bear attack. Said a big old male could get desperate, turn aggressive. I didn't buy it. Knew it wasn't any bear I'd ever seen. That night, I built a roaring bonfire in the clearing, strung floodlights around the cabin, and loaded every firearm I owned. Didn't sleep a wink, just sat there with my shotgun gripped tight, waiting for whatever was out there to show itself. It never did. For weeks, an uneasy silence settled over the area. The ranchers stopped losing cattle. Jedediah's death was brushed under the rug. I thought maybe whatever it was had moved on. I was wrong. I was out by the creek checking my fishing lines when I saw it. Crouched on a boulder, maybe fifty feet away. Tall, with long limbs that seemed to bend at unnatural angles. Its skin was leathery, stretched tight over bone. The head was wrong. Too big, the jaw too long. And the eyes, those damn yellow eyes that blazed in the twilight. I fumbled for my rifle, but the thing was gone in a flash, disappearing into the trees with unsettling speed. That night I heard it circling the cabin. The howls it made were nothing like any animal I knew, a mix of a scream and a snarl that chilled my blood. I fired blindly into the darkness more to vent my terror than anything else. It didn't stop the howling. Didn't stop until dawn. The next morning, I started packing. I abandoned the cabin, left most of my supplies. Took just the essentials and my guns. Figured speed was my best bet against that thing, whatever it was. I ran until I found a road, flagged down a passing logging truck and told the driver I'd lost my way while hiking. I never looked back. The city feels crowded after the woods, but I don't miss the silence anymore. Don't miss the feeling of those eyes watching from the dark. Sometimes, late at night, I think I hear a howl echoing down the street, mixed in with the sirens and traffic. I tell myself it's just the wind. Folks around here... They have their own stories about backwoods monsters, things that snatch folks in the night. Some call it a wendigo, others just say it's a skinwalker. Me, I don't know what the hell it was. But I know one thing, out there, in those wild, lonesome places, the maps don't tell the whole story. November 12, 2009 I was never much for city life. The crowds, the noise, the feeling like just another rat in the maze. So, when I got the opportunity to buy a chunk of land in the remote boundary waters up in Minnesota, I jumped at it. Call me Lucas. Ex-logger, spent enough of my life in the woods to know my way around an axe and a chainsaw. Figured I could build a cabin live off the grid, and leave the rat race behind. First summer went smooth. Got the cabin built on a ridge overlooking a small lake, did some fishing, cleared trails quiet life, but that's the way I liked it. Come fall, things started to feel, off. I'd wake up to strange noises at night, snapping branches, heavy footsteps circling just outside the cabin. One morning I found massive footprints in the mud by the fire pit, bigger than any humans. Figured it was a bear, maybe getting bold with winter coming. Reinforced the cabin doors, kept my rifle handy. Then Pete went missing. He had a place a few miles over, another off-gridder. We'd trade supplies sometimes, share a beer on his porch. Went to check on him one day found his cabin torn open like a sardine can. Blood was smeared on the walls, and there were those same massive footprints leading into the woods. Never found Pete's body. 
Word spread through the backwoods network. Some folks whispered bear attack. Others muttered something about Bigfoot. Me, I wasn't sure what to believe, but I knew one thing. Whatever was out there was dangerous. I started seeing it around then, just glimpses out of the corner of my eye. Hulking shape moving between trees, always just beyond the edge of the firelight at night. It was tall, bipedal, covered in dark hair. But its movements were wrong, too jerky, and its eyes, they shone yellow in the dark, like an animal's but with a cold intelligence that made my blood run cold. One evening, I was chopping firewood when I heard it growl, a low, rumbling sound that sent chills down my spine. Dropped my axe, bolted for the cabin, and slammed the door shut. It pounded against the walls, shaking the whole structure. I huddled inside, rifle clutched in my trembling hands, listening to its enraged howls echo through the night. That's when I knew I couldn't stay. I waited until dawn, then packed every essential I could manage into my old truck and got the hell out of there. Didn't even look back as I bounced down that rough logging road. Made it to the nearest town, told the sheriff some story about a wild animal getting into my cabin. He gave me a long, skeptical look. Maybe he didn't buy it. Maybe he did, but figured it was best some things get left unsaid. Never went back to those woods. Sold the land for a pittance. Figured it was the price of my life. Now I drift between odd jobs, sleep in cheap motels, never getting too comfortable. City lights don't seem so bad anymore. At night... Lying awake listening to the traffic rumble by, I sometimes swear I hear a deep, guttural growl out in the alleyway, and the faint echo of footsteps that aren't quite human. Out on the interstate, I sometimes imagine I see a hulking shape out of the corner of my eye, loping through the trees just beyond the tree lean, its yellow eyes fixed on my taillights. There's a name the locals up in the boundary waters have for it, the Wendigo. They say it's a spirit of hunger, an ancient thing that stalks the deep woods. I don't know what the hell it is, but I know this. There are places humanity was never meant to tread, where the shadows grow long, and old things still linger. My mistake was thinking I could escape them. This happened to me a few years back, on a business trip to Oregon. I'm Miles, sales rep, boring job, lots of flights, lots of time to kill in unfamiliar towns. But this one, it stuck with me. I should have known something was off from the moment I landed. Little airport, nestled way out amongst those towering pine forests the Pacific Northwest is famous for. The locals, they had a certain look to them. Kept to themselves, not unfriendly, but like they had secrets they weren't about to share. Place I stayed that night was an old motel on the edge of town. Room smelled like must and old cigarettes. But hey, it was cheap, and I wasn't planning on staying put. Next morning, I had some time before my meetings, so I decided to explore a bit. There was a hiking trail that started right behind the motel, heading off into the woods. Figured I could get some fresh air before another day spent trapped in conference rooms. Trail was more overgrown than the map made it seem. The trees closed in, sunlight barely filtering through the thick canopy. I started getting that prickly feeling at the back of my neck, like I was being watched. Should have listened to that instinct turn back while I could. That's when I found the clearing. Not a natural one. Trees were felled in a wide circle. The stumps hacked at roughly like someone was in a hurry. And in the center, well, it was an altar of some kind. Stacked stones, rough hewn, and stained with something dark and old. Then I saw the bones. Animal bones, mostly. Deer may be bigger. 
but mixed in were others I couldn't place. Skulls too long for coyotes, fragments of what looked like hands, but not human hands. A wave of nausea hit me then, and I stumbled back. That's when I heard the growl. It came from the far side of the clearing, low and guttural. My blood ran cold. I spun around and saw it. Standing just inside the tree line was the biggest damn wolf I'd ever seen. Easily the size of a bear cub, and its fur was the color of midnight. But those weren't wolf's eyes looking at me. They were too intelligent, with a cold, calculating gleam. And that muzzle, elongated, the teeth jutting out in a snarl. This wasn't a sick animal, wasn't some escaped zoo specimen. No, this was something different, something unnatural. I broke and ran. Didn't think, just a blind terror propelling me forward. I could hear it bounding after me, its breath rasping, but fear lent me a burst of speed. Branches whipped my face, I stumbled, regained my footing, kept going. Then, a different sound cut through the panic thudding of my own heart, a gunshot. It echoed off the trees, and I heard a yelp, more surprised than hurt. Then another shot, and a howl that cut off abruptly. The creature, whatever it was, had fled. Moments later, I broke through the trees and onto a dirt road. There, parked in a beat-up truck, was an old man with a rifle resting across the open window. He looked at me, his face creased with more than just age, and nodded. Thought I might have company out here, he grunted. Never seen you around before, though. I stammered out my thanks, asked him what the hell that had been back in the woods. His face grew grimmer. Dogman, he said voice low. Some folks call him that. They've been around these parts since before I was born. Hunt the woods and such. Don't always bother people. Well, you saw one hungry enough to get reckless. He lowered the rifle, gave me a long, scrutinizing look. Best head on back to town, son. Don't come back out this way, not unless you know how to handle yourself. I nodded, not trusting my voice. Got in my rental car, and drove straight to the airport. Missed my meetings, got on the first flight out of there, and never looked back. Some folks might say it was just a wild dog or something got loose. Maybe they're right. But I'll never forget the size of that thing, the cunning gleam in its eyes. And every now and then, lying awake at night, I hear the rustle of leaves on my window, and swear I smell the musty damp of that forest clearing. This happened to me a few years back, right outside of Missoula, Montana. I'm the outdoors type, you know? Hunting, fishing, a bit of a survivalist at heart. Always ready for anything. Name's Everett, Everett Klein. Missoula, Rio Rugged. We're talking dense forests, mountain ranges, everything that makes Montana wild. This particular trip, it wasn't just me. I was showing my buddy, Nolan, the ropes. City kid through and through. He wanted the full untamed wilderness experience, and I figured, why not? He could use a little dirt under his fingernails. We were off a backcountry trail, no marked pads, using a GPS to get us to an old fishing spot. Nolan was complaining the whole time. Bugs, blisters, you name it. I chuckled, handed him some bug spray and pushed on. Now, here's the weird part. Every now and then, I'd catch this smell. Like wet dog, but stronger, a bit rotten. Thought maybe it was roadkill hidden by the trees. I didn't say anything to Nolan, didn't want to spook him out even more than he already was. We reached the clearing near dusk. The lake was small but crystal clear, 
promising a good haul of trout. I cast my line, settling in, that's when I saw it, a flash of movement just beyond the tree lean. My pulse quickened, not with fear, but with that hunter's sense. A big buck, maybe? Nolan, oblivious, was busy swatting mosquitoes. Dude, I whispered, stay still. Something's out there. He froze, eyes wide. Then a branch snapped. Loud, right behind me. Instinct took hold. I grabbed Nolan's arm and bolted, ignoring our fishing gear and any semblance of stealth. It was on us fast. Too fast for a deer or even a bear. Glimpses through the trees showed it. Huge, lean, upright like a man, but not. For matted and patchy, a long muzzle, teeth bared in an inhuman snarl. What the hell is that? Nolan squeaked. I don't know, but run! I shouted back, my focus on not tripping and breaking our necks. Its breathing was guttural, a ragged rasp that echoed through the woods. Every time I thought it had given up, the sound would start again, closer. We ran for what felt like hours, finally reaching a stream. Too shallow for whatever was chasing us, I hoped. Crouched behind a boulder, we tried to catch our breath. Nolan was sobbing, tears streaming down his face. I felt a surge of guilt, then hardened my resolve. Come on, we gotta keep moving. It'll pick up our trail again. The hike back was a nightmare of whispers and shadows. That stink of wet dog, that snarling, it never really left us. Every time a twig snapped, Nolan flinched, eyes wide with a fear I understood now. We hit the main trailhead at dawn, stumbling into the parking lot and startling a group of early morning hikers. The ranger station was closed, but thank God for cell service. We called the sheriff, babbling about a monster, the wilderness, teeth, probably sounded like a couple of lunatics. The sheriff arrived, a heavy-set woman with a look that said she'd seen it all. We told our story, expecting disbelief. Instead, she got serious, nodded at some spots of blood near the trail and said, You boys are lucky. We've had reports of things out here. Don't go off trail again, you understand? Nolan hasn't touched a hiking pole since. Calls me a liar when I tell others the story. Part of me wishes I could write it off as a hallucination, a bad trip. But I know what I saw. I know I heard those snarls, felt that thing breathing down my neck. And I know, even in teeming cities with thousands around, I'll never feel truly safe again. The wild? It's not always as empty as you think. My name is Alex Thorne, and this happened to me in 2003. I was stationed in a remote corner of the Alaskan wilderness back then. Officially, I monitored seismic activity for the USGS. Unofficially, my job was listening for nuclear tests, troop movements, anything out of the ordinary in that vast, frozen expanse. Mostly it was dull routine, punctuated by supply drops and the occasional moose sighting. Then, one crisp October morning, everything changed. I married late, never the family type. That's probably why they stuck me out here. But even I felt a pang of loneliness walking into the cabin that morning and finding the radio dead. At first, I chalked it up to a solar flare, some minor glitch. I tried resetting the equipment, fiddled with the antenna alignment, nothing. Frustration turned to unease. Protocol demanded I report any technical issues immediately, but with the radio out. Well, that's when I saw the footprints. They appeared out of nowhere, a single line leading away from the cabin into the trees. 
Fresh snow had fallen overnight, making the track stand out in stark relief against the pristine white landscape. They weren't human, too large for any person. Now I'd heard the local stories' tales of giant bears, creatures out of legend. But I never quite believed them. Yet there those footprints were. Curiosity, more than fear, propelled me forward. I grabbed my rifle from the rack, more for reassurance than anything else, and followed the tracks Alaska transforms you. It strips away the layers of city dweller, leaving you raw, alert. I moved with a practiced silence, senses reaching out into the quiet. The tracks led deeper into the woods, winding between pines and stands of birch. Every so often, I'd spot a splatter of red, too vivid against the snow to be anything natural. My grip on the rifle tightened. Something was hurt, possibly badly injured. Whatever made those tracks, it was a predator. I started seeing other disturbances, overturned rocks, broken branches, signs of a struggle. Then the trees opened out, and the tracks disappeared. Before me lay a small clearing, and in its center, carnage. The carcass of an elk, half-devoured, ribs exposed to the indifferent sky. And around it, more of those impossible footprints. I approached cautiously, rifle raised, trying to piece together the scene. Whatever did this wasn't after a tidy meal. The carcass was mangled, torn open with a ferocity that sent a shiver down my spine. There were gashes on the half-frozen hide that didn't look like the work of any claws or teeth I knew. While examining the scene, I almost missed it, that flicker of movement at the edge of the clearing. I whirled around, rifle raised, and saw it. Not the hulking beast I half expected. Instead, it was lean, with a long, sinuous body that seemed oddly boneless. The fur, mottled gray and brown, clung to wet-looking skin that stretched too tightly over its powerful frame. Its head was wrong. Triangular, with a blunt snout, all teeth and predatory eyes. Those eyes met mine, a cold intelligence glinting in their depths. Neither bear, nor wolf, nor anything from the textbooks. I froze. Adrenaline surged through me. Every survival instinct trained into me by the CIA screamed at me to run, to shoot. Instead, I did something almost incomprehensibly stupid. I reached for my camera. I have that picture still, tucked away in a safe where top-secret files used to be. It's blurry, taken with shaking hands. But the creature is clear enough, its head raised, a low growl rumbling from deep within its chest. A twig snapped behind me. I turned, rifle swinging up. A man stood at the edge of the clearing, dressed in furs, weathered face unreadable. In his hands was a crude, homemade spear. He stared at the creature, then at me, and lowered his weapon slightly. In a voice thick with a Russian accent, he said, They have come back. His English was broken, limited. We managed a stilted conversation. His name was Victor, a trapper who lived a solitary existence deep in these woods. He knew of the creature, of others like it. Apparently, these sightings had increased recently. The locals whispered of an ancient legend reawakened, a creature banished long ago, now returned. Whether it was superstition or some monstrous flesh-and-blood reality, I couldn't be sure. This much was clear, though. Something was out there, something dangerous, and its hunting ground included my little corner of nowhere. The rest of that day is a haze in my memory. Victor helped me drag the remains of the elk back to my cabin. He refused to enter, communicating with a mix of grunts and gestures. Before he retreated back into the trees, he pointed towards the carcass, then at the creature's retreating form. He mimed an explosion with his hands, and gave me a grave look. 
I understood the gist. This was more than a lone predator. It was something different, a potential ecological disaster unfolding in my quiet corner of the world. When I finally got the radio working, a mysteriously loose wire was the culprit. My report to HQ was met with the usual mix of disbelief and demands for proof. I sent the photo, knowing it wouldn't be enough. That should have been the end of it, but it wasn't. A supply drop was due in three days. The pilot, an easygoing guy named Carl, joked that the only danger out here was dying of boredom. The day of the drop dawned clear and freezing. I spent the morning nervously checking equipment, trying to ignore the prickle of unease down my spine. Carl's plane buzzed in right on schedule, circled once, waggled its wings. Just another day in the Alaskan wilderness. I marked the cleared landing area, anticipating the influx of supplies, the brief contact with the outside world. Carl never landed. I saw the flicker in the trees first. Then his scream, cut off midward, echoed through the stillness. I ran towards the source of the sound, rifle in hand, my mind racing. Too late. There was nothing left but blood in the snow and a trail of footprints leading back into the woods. I went numb. I radioed HQ, my voice flat, reporting what happened to Carl. They promised a full investigation team in a matter of days. Days. That night I didn't sleep. I sat with the lights on, rifle across my lap, staring at the door. Every rustle of wind... Every creak of the cabin was the creature, coming for me. Help arrived, but it wasn't enough. Two grizzled agents in parkas, and a wildlife biologist named Dr. Jensen, a woman with sharp eyes and skepticism etched on her face. They took my statement, examined the remains of the elk, tracked the footprints. Jensen argued it was a bear, a mutated one, maybe. The agents muttered about animal attacks and me cracking under the isolation. That evening, they made camp near the edge of the clearing. I stayed in the cabin, ostensibly the safest place, but it felt like a trap. Jensen came by before nightfall, dropping off a powerful tranquilizer rifle. Just in case, she said, but her tone implied she thought I was losing my grip on reality. Darkness fell like a curtain. They'd strung motion sensor lights around their camp. I sat in my darkened cabin, staring out the window at the glowing ring that was their only defense. Then, the first light flickered off. I heard a shout, a roar of inhuman fury. The second light went dark, and then the third. Gunshots rang out, echoing in the silence. The gunfire stopped abruptly. A terrible, keening cry rang out, echoing through the trees. Then, nothing but the soft whisper of falling snow. I waited, heart pounding. Had it retreated? Were they alive? Sunrise seemed an eternity away. When the first light of dawn crept over the horizon, I forced myself outside. The camp was a scene of devastation. Blood stained the trampled snow. Sleeping bags were torn open, supplies scattered. There were more of those footprints and drag marks, but no bodies. The search proved futile. They vanished without a trace, like Carl before them. I was the only one left. HQ finally took me seriously. They sent more men, tactical teams armed to the teeth. They hunted through those woods, set traps, analyzed stat, even brought in thermal drones. Found nothing. The creature was a ghost, leaving behind only death and unanswered questions. They wanted me to stay, help them understand, but I couldn't. Alaska would always be that place now, the place where unseen horrors lurked, where people vanished in the blink of an eye. I took a desk job, pushing papers in a secure facility on the mainland. It's safer this way, they tell me. 
safer maybe, but not the same. Sometimes, when the wind whispers through the air conditioning vents, I imagine it's the rustle of leaves in the Alaskan forest. And sometimes, I dream of the clearing, and footprints in the snow, and the cold, intelligent eyes of a creature born from nightmares. The story doesn't end neatly. Some mysteries refuse to be contained within the pages of a report. I tried to forget. Tried to convince myself it was mass hysteria, a trick of the mind in that lonely place. But the photo is still there, and the memory still flickers. They say those who work in the shadows walk a fine line between what's real and what isn't. That day in Alaska, I crossed that line. And I never fully found my way back. My name's Grant Miller. And this whole mess happened back in November 2008. Back then, I was running with a specialized unit within the CIA, handling jobs that were equal parts dangerous and bizarre. Think less James Bond, more X-Files. We were the guys they called when things got weird. Like most people in this line of work, I can't tell my wife the details, the half-truths of business trips long ago becoming as familiar as breathing. The assignment seemed simple on the surface. Investigate unusual wildlife sightings in a remote section of Yellowstone National Park. We thought it was probably some rancher's experiment gone wrong or a hoax to drum up tourism. What we encountered in those woods was, let's just say bears and mountain lions are the least scary things lurking in the American wilderness. Our team was four strong me, Nguyen, Carter, and Brooks. Nguyen was our tech expert, the kind of guy who could hack a UFO if he had to. Carter was the muscle, ex-military with a deadpan sense of humor that would have been funny if we weren't constantly on the brink of getting torn limb from limb. Brooks was our wildlife specialist, and probably the sanest one of the bunch. We set out into the park in early autumn. Yellowstone's a breathtaking place, the kind that reminds you how small a person is in the grand scheme of things. But there was unease in the air, a prickling at the back of my neck that told me those woods weren't as pristine as they seemed. The first few days were mostly about tracking. We found enormous, clawed footprints that didn't match any known animal. Brooks nearly fainted when he found Scott the size of a basketball and one's equipment picked up strange energy readings he swore shouldn't be possible. But the creature itself stayed elusive. We built camp in a clearing near a stream. It felt more exposed than usual, but it was the best we could find given the terrain. Carter rigged the perimeter with infrared sensors, his gruff voice cutting through the silent forest. Think those little wires are gonna stop whatever made those tracks? I asked him, only half joking. He shrugged, his face unreadable in the twilight. Gives us a warning at least. Night fell quickly, and with it came an unnerving silence. No rustling leaves or animal calls, just this oppressive stillness. Nguyen spent the evening hunched over his laptop, muttering about corrupted data and impossible frequencies. Sleep was fitful. I woke with a start, a sense of wrongness hanging heavy in the air. It wasn't a sound that woke me, but the absence of it. Suddenly, an air-splitting screech tore through the night. It was high-pitched, filled with fury, and unlike anything I'd ever heard. Carter's perimeter alarms went haywire, flashing madly in the darkness. We got movement, multiple targets, big! His voice was a tense whisper through the comms. I grabbed my rifle and scrambled out of the tent. The others weren't far behind, their faces pale in the beams of our flashlights. Out there, just at the edge of the light, multiple pairs of eyes shone at us, brilliant, predatory yellow. Then the creatures stepped out of the darkness. 
Each one was a monstrosity. They stood at least seven feet tall, their bodies covered in thick, matted fur that looked like it could turn aside bullets. But the worst was their heads. Muzzles stretched out into wolf-like snouts filled with jagged, blood-stained teeth. Their eyes burned with that impossible yellow light, filled with a chilling intelligence. We opened fire, the gunshots shattering the silent forest. The creatures shrieked in rage and charged. Nguyen went down first. One of the monsters lunged for him, its wickedly curved claws ripping through his Kevlar vest, spraying gore across the damp earth. He barely had time to scream. Carter roared and unleashed a fresh volley of gunfire, driving several of the creatures back. He grabbed Nguyen's radio, his voice shaking. We need backup now. I repeat, we. A terrifying blur of movement, and Carter was gone. Snatched from the ground so fast I barely registered it. All that remained was his gun, lying forgotten in the grass. Brooks and I were back to back, spraying desperate shots into the darkness. One of the creatures went down, a thick black ichor oozing from a chest wound but there were still at least three of them. They were toying with us, enjoying the hunt. Brooks let out a strangled cry as one of the monsters circled behind him. Before I could react it lunged, its immense jaws clamping around his leg. He screamed in agony, firing blindly into the creature, but it dragged him bodily into the trees. His gunshots rang out, then were abruptly, chillingly cut off. I was alone. Panic was a jagged shard of ice in my veins, but I forced it down. There was no time for fear. The smell of blood hung thick in the air, Nguyen's, Carter's, Brooks. It was the smell of death. And those monstrous eyes were still there in the shadows, watching, calculating. I stumbled backwards, desperately trying to reload as the creatures advanced. Somewhere in the back of my mind, a voice was screaming about protocol, about securing evidence, but all I could think about was survival. Then I tripped over a tree root and tumbled to the ground, my rifle clattering away out of reach. I scrambled back, fumbling blindly in my pack for my backup sidearm. My fingers brushed against the cold metal of the pistol just as a monstrous form leaped towards me. I squeezed the trigger, again and again, the roar of gunfire deafening in the sudden stillness. The creature reared up, its guttural shriek cutting through the night. Dark blood splattered the ground, and it collapsed with a final, shuddering spasm. My hands shook as I struggled to my feet. But there were still two of them out there. I knew even then that I wasn't going to make it off that mountain. It was just a matter of how long I could hold them off. I wasn't going down without a fight. I fumbled for something, anything in my bag that might give me an edge. My hand closed around a flare. It wasn't much, but it was better than nothing. With shaking fingers, I struck the flare and hurled it towards the remaining creatures. It landed at their feet, hissing and sparking, casting garish red light across their monstrous forms. They backed away, snarling in confusion. Fire, primal and unpredictable. Maybe it spooked them. I took my chance, sprinting through the trees, ignoring the stabbing pain in my side from my earlier fall. I had no idea where I was going, but anywhere had to be better than that clearing. The creatures roared in anger behind me, but they didn't pursue, at least not immediately. I ran until my lungs felt like they were going to burst. Branches tore at my face and the ground was uneven, but I didn't dare stop. Finally, gasping for breath, I collapsed behind a fallen log, the pulse pounding in my ears so loud I could barely hear the creatures crashing through the woods in my wake. How long they searched for me, I don't know. After a while, blessed silence descended. I lay there, 
my body throbbing, waiting for the inevitable, but the attack never came. Perhaps they had given up, or were waiting for daylight. Either way, it bought me some time. As dawn broke, I pushed myself up and started moving again, stumbling through the dense undergrowth. I had no destination in mind, only the blind instinct to put as much distance as possible between myself and that blood-soaked clearing. By some miracle, I found a ranger station later that day. It was deserted, the radio equipment dead. I managed to patch my wounds and send out a garbled distress signal on the emergency broadcast band. Rescue arrived two days later. My wild story of monsters in the woods was met with skepticism, with thinly veiled assumptions of shock-induced delusions. It took weeks of debriefings and psych evaluations before the brass was satisfied I would keep my mouth shut and fall in line. The aftermath is a blur. There were cover stories, hushed whispers about rogue bear attacks, and missing persons reports quietly buried in park archives. No evidence of the creatures was ever found. My team was declared officially dead, their names added to a memorial somewhere in Langley that they don't make a big show about to the public. I never went back to the CIA. I left that life behind and tried to bury the memory of that night deep within me. You can go ahead and call me crazy, call me traumatized. I won't argue with you. Sometimes, late at night, I see those yellow eyes in the darkness and hear Nguyen's scream echoing through the trees. Most days, I manage to convince myself it was a nightmare, a hallucination born from exhaustion and terror. I tell myself that those creatures couldn't possibly be real, that the rational world I cling to hasn't devolved entirely into chaos. But on some nights, when the wind whispers through the trees outside my window, sounding eerily like a deathly screech, I start to doubt my own sanity. Because I know what I saw out there, what tore my team apart. And in the deepest hours of the night, a terrifying truth remains. We were the lucky ones that day. If those creatures were smart enough to toy with us, to hunt us for sport, who knows how many others they took? There's a darkness in those woods, a primal, ancient hunger. And the most horrifying thought of all is this, perhaps... Even now, they're still out there, waiting, watching, and biding their time. We think we're the ones in control, the apex predators of this planet. But sometimes, at night, I get the chilling feeling that we're not at the top of the food chain at all. That in the vast, uncharted corners of this world, true monsters might be lurking creatures beyond our comprehension, for whom we are nothing more than prey. And with every creak of a floorboard, every flicker of shadow, the fear claws at me that someday, they might come calling again. My name's Marcus, and this happened to me back in 2010. I've been driving the long-haul routes for longer than I care to count. There's something about the open road that calls to a certain type of person, I think. Liking your own company helps. My wife passed a few years back, leaving me with the house and our old dog, Murphy. The miles help keep the loneliness at bay. Most of the time. This particular run had me hauling a load of industrial supplies down to Florida. I'd picked up the rig in Nashville already starting to feel the heat and humidity clinging to me as I crossed into Georgia. The A.C. in my truck had been on the fritz for weeks, making for a sweaty, miserable drive. I decided to push on until sundown at least, hoping to find a rest stop with shade where I could park and maybe catch a few hours of sleep before reaching the coast. In the fading light, I started keeping an eye out for a suitable spot to pull over, the signs just kept promising attractions and gas stations miles in the distance. 
Just as I was about to give up and resign myself to another night of sweating in the cab, I saw a billboard looming ahead, the paint faded and peeling. Billy's Oasis Motel and Diner, two miles, cold drinks, hot meals, affordable rates. It didn't sound fancy, but the promise of a chilled drink was almost enough to make me weep. I signaled the exit, a narrow two-lane road disappearing into the trees. After two miles of dense Georgia pines, Billy's Oasis appeared on the right side of the road. It was just as the billboard advertised, a rundown motel, the neon buzzing off and on, and a dusty diner with a few weather-beaten picnic tables outside. But hey, at least it looked deserted. A quick scan of the parking lot showed a single rusty pickup truck and a beat-up motorcycle. Perfect. I wouldn't have to socialize. I parked as far away from the other vehicles as the lot permitted. Murphy whined from the passenger seat, eager to stretch his legs, so I clipped on his leash and opened the door for him. As he hopped down, he let loose a disgruntled bark as if picking up on a vibe only dogs can sense. All right, old-timer, we'll just be in and out, I said more to reassure myself than my dog. Pushing through the diner door, I was greeted with dim lighting and the stale smell of old fryer grease. A bell fixed above the door jangled, announcing my presence. A figure appeared from somewhere in the back, a tall, lanky man probably in his late fifties, with stringy hair and a vacant, distant look in his eyes. You folks open? I called out, surveying the deserted booths and the chipped counter. The man gave a slow nod. His lips twitched, forming what I think was meant to be a smile. It had the opposite effect on me, sending a shiver down my spine. We got food rooms. What'll it be? His voice was rough, disused. Just a drink. Iced tea if you got it. I glanced over at Murphy, who was sniffing hopefully at the swinging kitchen door, probably picking up on the scent of burgers. And maybe a bowl of water for the dog here. The man shuffled behind the counter and rooted around in a rusted fridge. Eventually, he produced a sweating glass and a chipped china bowl. He filled them both from a plastic pitcher on the counter. The iced tea had a cloudy residue and the water looked murky, but I wasn't about to complain. Murphy, bless his indiscriminate doggy heart, lapped the water down happily. I paid, and the man gave me another one of those unsettling smiles, the kind that don't reach the eyes. As I walked out, I realized he hadn't said a word since I'd walked in. The whole place just fell off, like I'd stumbled into a movie set where something sinister was about to go down. Murphy seemed to be picking up on the vibe too, pulling at his leash to get back to the truck. We hustled back across the lot, the darkness of the surrounding woods seeming more oppressive, more observant all of a sudden. I could just make out the shape of the lanky man in the diner's doorway, staring out at us. A prickle of unease ran down my spine. As soon as I got back in the truck, I fired it up. I didn't even care about finding shade anymore. I just wanted to put some distance between myself and Billy's oasis. I drove through the night, pulling up at a crowded truck stop at around 3 a.m. for a few hours of fitful rest. When I woke up, the sun was high and the world had mostly righted itself. But the memory of that empty diner and its strange, silent occupant lingered. Later on the CB, I overheard some other truckers chatting about backroads, local stops. Anyone been to Billy's Oasis lately? One crackly voice inquired. There was a pause, then someone else chimed in, his voice tinged with dark amusement. Not since Billy up and disappeared a couple years back. They say his wife took off, and old Billy went a little, well, not right in the head, if you catch my drift. Someone else chuckled.
place has been empty since. Some folks say it's haunted by Billy. Guess some part of him stayed behind. There were a few more jokes. The name Billy tossed around casually like he was some kind of ghost story. But I knew what I'd seen. And I couldn't shake the feeling that whoever, or whatever, was running Billy's oasis was still watching me drive away. My name is Harlan Jacobs. I've been hauling cargo nationwide for longer than I care to remember. Makes a fella see some things out on the road. Mostly good, some bad, but nothing like this. Nothing that would make folks question your sanity if they heard the story. This all started around 03, up in Wyoming. Late August in Wyoming is a beautiful thing. Sky so blue it stretches on forever, those mountains in the distance. A touch of coolness in the air after the summer heat. It had been a good run so far, and I made it into Cheyenne feeling decent, in need of a real meal and a proper stretch of the legs. There's a truck stop a ways off the I-80, not the fanciest, but it usually has what I'm looking for. Pulling in, I noticed something was off. Hardly any trucks in the lot, and just a single car parked by the diner. City folk, probably, just passing through. I chalked it up to being the lull between meal rushes, and went inside. The first thing that hit me was the quiet. No chatter of truckers, no clank of dishes, just silence, broken by that low hum every old diner seems to have. The second thing was the smell. Not burnt food or anything rotten, but something sharp, metallic. Like iron and rain and something I couldn't place. The waitress, an older woman named Bev, if her name tag was right, didn't ask my order. Just gave me a long look and said, Coffee's fresh, before shuffling back behind the counter. Figured she'd had a long day. My coffee arrived moments later. Steam curling up from the thick ceramic mug. It smelled fine, but when I took a sip, it tasted wrong. Bitter and a bit off, like it had gone cold and been reheated one time too many. I put the mug down and decided food wasn't worth the risk. Leaving a few bucks on the table, I went to use the restroom before hitting the road again. That's when I saw it. Blood. Spattered across the sink, the floor, even a few streaks high up on the grimy tile wall. Not a few drops, but like someone had opened a vein in there. Something prickled the back of my neck. I went back into the dining room, figuring on getting Bev to call and whatever had happened, but there was nobody there. No waitress, no car out front. It was like they'd vanished into thin air. I left the money for the untouched coffee by the door and practically ran for my truck. As I pulled back onto the highway, I spotted it in the rearview mirror. A figure, standing on the shoulder, just beyond the truck stop. Tall and possibly thin, dressed in tattered clothes as if he'd walked a hundred miles of hard road to get there. In the waning daylight, my eyes couldn't make out his features, but the way he stood head tilted slightly, like a bird assessing its prey, that sent shivers down my spine. I put my foot down, leading the truck stop and the strange figure behind. For the rest of that haul, I felt his gaze on me. Not the kind you can see, but that deep, instinctual feeling of being watched. I tried brushing it off as nerves, exhaustion, but the pit in my stomach wouldn't go away. Stopped for the night a couple hundred miles up the road. Barely slept a wink. When I finished that run and swung back around through Wyoming again, I half expected to see the truck stop boarded up, yellow police tape strung across the entrance. But it was right there, like always, buzzing with truckers fueling up and grabbing a bite. On a whim, I pulled in. 
The diner looked cleaner somehow brighter. There were folks eating, a new waitress behind the counter. The whole place had that low-level din you'd expect. I ordered a burger, mostly to see if anyone else reacted. Nobody did. Ate it just to make sure it tasted normal. It did. It all seemed fine, ordinary, like the previous experience had never happened. Yet, that sense of unease never fully left me. Months turned into years. Ran more Wyoming roots, never saw a hint of trouble. Started to think maybe I had dreamed the whole thing up, that bad coffee, the blood. But then, news reports started trickling in. Disappearances. Truckers, a lone hiker, even a couple on a road trip. The last known place was always some lonesome stretch of Wyoming Highway. No trace ever found, like they winked out of existence. They didn't make a big splash in the papers, but word like that travels fast in trucker circles. We all started choosing different routes, bypassing the state entirely whenever possible. That uneasy feeling settled back over me, heavier this time. I knew, somewhere in my gut, that the figure by the truck stop, those disappearances, they were connected. But connecting it how? To what? It gnawed at me for months, the not knowing. Then, last fall, I was hauling a load through Nebraska. Stopped at a hole-in-the-wall diner in the middle of nowhere. Just as I was sitting down, I caught movement out of the corner of my eye. He was there, standing outside the window. Same hunched, ragged a figure, but this time the daylight laid his features bare. Sallow skin stretched tight over bone, eyes sunk so deep in his skull they looked like empty holes, and a smile, that damned smile, thin and sharp, like a predator showing its teeth. I froze. For a heartbeat, time seemed to stutter. Then, he tilted his head ever so slightly and turned away, disappearing around the side of the building. My blood ran cold. He was here. That meant... Fumbling in my pocket, I slammed down a handful of bills on the table and stumbled out of the diner. My truck was still parked out front where I'd left it. He could be anywhere. I scanned the parking lot, the scrubby expanse of plains stretching out to the horizon, my heart pounding a frantic tattoo against my ribs. There. A flash of movement by the dumpster out back. I broke into a run, the gravel crunching beneath my boots. Rounding the corner, I saw him. He was crouching, back turned to me, and he was... eating. My stomach turned. It wasn't an animal carcass, but something long and pale, a human shape. Bile rose in my throat, and I clapped a hand over my mouth, stifling a gag. He must have heard me, because he straightened, his movements twitchy and uneven. There was blood smeared around his mouth, dripping in crimson rivulets down his chin. And his eyes... God, those eyes, when he turned to look at me, they were filled with a dark, hungry glee that made my skin crawl. I don't know how long I stood there, paralyzed with terror. Then, instinct kicked in. I whirled and ran. He let out an ear-piercing screech that echoed across the empty landscape. I heard him behind me, his footsteps crunching on the gravel. He was closing in. I reached my truck, fumbling with the keys, my fingers shaking uncontrollably. Just as I yanked the door open, he lunged for me. I ducked inside, slammed the door shut, and threw it into gear. Tires spitting gravel, I peeled out of the parking lot and back onto the highway. In the rearview mirror, I saw him standing in the middle of the road, his spindly frame silhouetted against the setting sun. He didn't move as I sped away, he just watched. And I knew, deep down, it wasn't over. I drove through the night, never stopping, not once. My brain raced, 
a frantic jumble of fear and desperate plans. I couldn't go to the cops. Who would believe me? Even if they did, how do you catch a creature like that? I needed proof, evidence, something. But first, I needed to get away. I kept driving, fueled by a cocktail of coffee, truck stop snacks, and pure, bone-deep terror. Days turned into a sleepless blur. I crossed state lines, changed my route on a whim, took back roads to avoid major highways. But all the while, I could feel his presence out there, a shadow hanging over me. The knowledge that he was always just a few steps behind. Then, on a deserted stretch of road cutting through New Mexico, I saw my chance. A billboard loomed in the distance, advertising a roadside attraction, the world's largest petrified man. I pulled over, my mind already racing. It was risky, stupid maybe, but it might be my only option. The attraction was a relic, one of those tourist traps that flourished decades ago but now clung to life on the fumes of nostalgia. It was deserted, just a dusty parking lot fronted by a ticket booth and a towering fiberglass statue of a cowboy. I grabbed my tire iron from under the seat and went to work. I smashed the headlights of my truck, gouged long scratches down the side panels, ripped the side mirrors off. It hurt to vandalize my rig like that, my livelihood on wheels. But I had to make it believable. When I was done, it looked like I'd been run off the road, attacked. Then I took out my phone. I'd never been so glad to get terrible cell service. Dialing 911, my fingers shook so hard I nearly dropped the phone. I gasped out my location, gave a panicked description of an ambush, assailants unknown, and begged for help. My voice was barely above a whisper, cracked with fear. They promised to send a unit, but out here that could mean hours. Now, the waiting game. I sat in my wrecked truck, sweating despite the chill of the desert night, and watched the road. It seemed to take an eternity, but finally, headlights appeared in the distance. A state trooper's car pulled up, and an officer stepped out, flashlight cutting a swath through the darkness. I stumbled out of my truck, playing the part of the terrified survivor. My story poured out in hiccuping half-truths, forced off the road, attackers wearing masks. I fought back, managed to escape. I didn't mention the creature that would ensure a trip to the psych ward. The officer surveyed the damage, looked shaken. He called it in, promised reinforcements, told me to wait there, stay safe. Then he left. Hours passed. Nobody came. No other troopers, no ambulance, just the silence of the desert stretching out under the vast expanse of the starry sky. The exhaustion was seeping into my bones, but I didn't dare close my eyes. I had to stay on guard, stay ready. Just before dawn, the headlights reappeared. Several cars this time. I could make out the shapes of a tow truck, an ambulance, salvation, maybe. Then, my gut clenched. In the lead car, I could see him. The creature from the truck stop, from the diner, silhouetted in the passenger seat. A dark, twisted grin stretched across his face. He'd used the cop to find me. I bolted. Blindly, I ran for the petrified cowboy statue, the fiberglass monstrosity my only hope of hiding. I scrambled over the low fence and dove behind it, heart pounding in my ears. Footsteps crunched on gravel, closer and closer. They were searching. He was out there. Then, the ambulance engine roared to life. I peered cautiously around the statue's leg. They were driving away, taillights glowing red in the pre-dawn darkness. Relief washed over me, then a fresh surge of determination. They thought they had me trapped, helpless. They were wrong. 
The moment they disappeared from sight, I emerged from my hiding spot. They'd taken the road, heading back towards civilization. My only hope lay in the opposite direction, deeper into the wilderness. I struck out across the desert, the petrified cowboy fading into the distance behind me. The sun rose, casting a harsh, unforgiving light on the arid landscape. I had no water, no food, just the adrenaline coursing through my veins, and the grim determination to survive. I stumbled on, the rough ground tearing at my boots, my clothes snagging on thorny brush. My throat burned with thirst, my vision wavered at the edges. But I pushed on, driven by the image of those hollow eyes, that predatory grin. Days blurred together. I moved from shadow to shadow during the blistering heat, staggered on by starlight when the desert chill set in. I scavenged what I could, a puddle of brackish water in a dry creek bed, a handful of shriveled berries that tasted more of sand than fruit. I started seeing things, mirages shimmering on the horizon, distorted shapes flickering at the edge of my perception. Hunger gnawed at my insides, and the sun scorched my skin raw. I don't know how much longer I could have lasted. Then, a miracle. A plume of smoke snaking up into the clear blue sky. Someone was out here. A ranch. A hermit's cabin. Someone who could help. With renewed strength, I staggered toward the smoke, each ragged breath a promise. As I drew closer, a ramshackle dwelling materialized out of the haze. A rusted-out trailer. A corral. Horses kicking up dust in the pen. There was a pickup truck parked out front, a faded red with a cracked windshield. Salvation. I stumbled towards the trailer, my voice a hoarse croak by the time I reached the door. Help! I gasped, knocking feebly. The door swung open, and a wave of nausea washed over me. I recognized the face framed in the doorway. It was him. The creature. Only, now, he wasn't a ragged scarecrow. Here, he was someone else. He wore work jeans, a checkered shirt, his hair neatly combed, that hideous grin replaced with a friendly smile. Well, now, you look a mite lost, friend. He drawled, his voice smooth and deceptively normal. Come on in, get yourself out of the sun. Despair settled over me like a shroud. I should have known. There was nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. They were everywhere. I stumbled inside. It smelled of cooked meat, not the rotting stench I'd associated with him, but something hot, greasy, almost inviting. He shut the door behind me and gestured to a worn kitchen table. Sit down. I was just fixing some breakfast. On the table sat a plate piled high with eggs, bacon, and something else. Long strips of meat, glistening with fat, charred at the edges. A pile of gnawed bones lay beside the plate. My stomach twisted. He saw the look on my face, and his grin widened. Nothing like fresh game in the morning. He chuckled, sliding into the seat across from me. He picked up a strip of meat and took a bite, tearing the flesh with sharp, uneven teeth. You're a hunter, I choked out, my voice barely above a whisper. Best kind of hunter, he said with a wink. Plenty of strays out here, nobody to miss them. That's when I fully understood. Outcasts, loners, people on the fringes of society, easy targets. He lured them here fattened them up, then feasted. And the cops, the troopers, they were in on it too, delivering victims right to his waiting table. You won't get away with it, I said, but even to my own ears it sounded weak. Get away with what? he asked, tilting his head. Nobody's gonna come looking for you, old-timer. Nobody cares about a washed-up trucker who disappears on the long haul. No wife, no kids. He shrugged. 
Just another statistic. A sob tore itself from my throat. I wasn't afraid of dying anymore. What terrified me was what came after, oblivion, swallowed into the darkness, erased from the world without leaving a trace. A dark resolve hardened within me. He might break my body, take my life, but they wouldn't take my voice. Someone will find this place. I forced out, staring him dead in the eye. People will know. That's when the first bullet ripped through the trailer wall, throwing up splinters of wood. He let out a startled yell as a second shot shattered the window above the sink. I scrambled for cover as more gunfire erupted. You got company, a voice boomed from outside. Backup had arrived. Not who I expected, but here nonetheless. Hunters, perhaps, drawn by the gunshots. I crawled behind the upturned table just as the trailer door burst open, followed by a volley of gunfire. The trailer erupted into chaos. Screams, more gunshots, the thudding of bodies hitting the floor. I stayed huddled in my shelter, not daring to raise my head. Then silence. I waited, barely breathing, listening for any sign of movement. A pair of battered cowboy boots appeared in my field of vision. A man stood over me, rifle slung over one shoulder. He had the weathered face of someone who spent their life outdoors, and there was a grim look in his eyes as he took in the carnage. You okay? he grunted. I nodded dumbly, unable to speak. He surveyed the scene, the bodies sprawled on the floor. One of them lay closest, a pool of blood spreading from beneath his unnaturally thin frame. Damn, the man muttered. Heard whispers about something like this, preying on travelers. Never thought it was real. He squatted down and touched the creature's waxy skin, the open, staring eyes. What the hell is it? Doesn't matter, I said, finally finding my voice. It's over. I told my story, to the hunter and the cops who eventually showed up. They found more bodies hidden around the property, skeletal remains, evidence of a killing spree that had gone on for far too long. My truck, with its smashed headlights and false damage, cemented my story about the ambush. Headlines flared about a monstrous cannibal clan brought down, a remote desert hideaway exposed. The aftermath was long, complicated, messy, but I survived. My name is Travis Dunn, and this happened to me on July 22, 2009. I don't even know how to tell this. Makes me sound nuts, I guess, but this stuff is my job. You see, I don't fix potholes for the city. I work for the folks who get called in when things, things most people don't believe even exist, cause problems. Yeah, I'm one of those monster hunters you always joked about. Only, we work for the government, so it's all official, hush-hush stuff. This particular business trip started in Arizona. You ever been there in July? It melts your brain. It's so damn hot. Not exactly where you want to be in full tactical gear. But the locals had been reporting some disturbing stuff. Campers going missing in a stretch of desert outside Flagstaff. Turns out, small towns hear everything. The disappearances themselves, well... Folks vanish in the wilderness, sadly. Misjudge the terrain, dehydration takes hold, it happens. But these were different. Whispers started making the rounds about, well, about creatures. Big, shadowy things moving faster than any animal should. Talk about eyes glowing in the night. Yeah, folks were scared. So, here I was with my team... Peterson, the tech expert, Ramirez with his outdoorsman knowledge and quiet ways, and Dr. Evans, 
our resident biologist with the no-nonsense attitude. Not your average office crew, that's for sure. We spent the first few days scouting the area. It was rough terrain, rocky gorges, those weird cactus things standing like sentinels. Ramirez found some tracks. Now I've been doing this since I was a green recruit, and I've seen weird stuff, but these things, they were big, like a man, but the prints were all wrong, too many toes, claws too long. Evans took careful moldings, muttering about bone structure and evolution gone sideways. Night fell quickly in the desert, which is good for stakeouts, and not so good for the nerves. It was my turn on watch. The first few hours passed with just the usual desert sounds, the odd lizard scuttling past, the distant wail of a coyote. Then I swear I heard something else. A heavy, shuffling noise from up a ridge. I held my breath, rifle ready. A shadow moved across the rocks, blotting out the moonlight for a moment. Whatever it was, it was big, bipedal at least. It moved cautiously toward one of the campsites we'd set up, a dummy camp with a thermal sensor rig by Peterson. My finger was on the trigger, heart pounding. Then the thing stopped, hunched over with its back to me. My training told me to take the shot, to neutralize the creature. But something held me back. It was the posture, a hesitation I couldn't explain. Humans don't stand like that. Not unless. A snap of a branch made it bolt. I saw it clearly then. It wasn't like anything in our manuals. Sure, it was tall, maybe seven feet, and thin, with skin so pale it was almost luminous. But its arms were too long, ending in wicked-looking claws. And its face, if you could call it that, no eyes, just slits. A mouth lipless and gaping wide with rows of needle-like teeth. Then it was gone, vanishing into the rocks like it wasn't even solid. I signaled the others. They found me wide-eyed and probably pale as a ghost. The thermal sensor hadn't picked up anything. Ramirez found more tracks, clear prints heading away from the camp into deeper desert. It's out there. I told them. And it's smart. The next day, we tracked it. That desert was unforgiving, sun beating down, every rock and shadow starting to look like our target. Ramirez was the best at spotting the tracks. He'd stop, study the ground, then beckon us forward. Hours went by. We were getting reckless, spread out too far. It was just after noon when I heard Peterson cry out. I ran towards the sound, rifle raised. Up ahead, Peterson was on the ground, thrashing, something dark wrapped around him. My mind stuttered. Was I seeing this right? The thing was a tangle of limbs, spindly and far too numerous, like some nightmarish spider. Its body, if it had one, was small hunched over Peterson. It was sucking on him, or something. I fired, emptying half my magazine into the damn thing. It shrieked, a rasping inhuman noise, and scrambled off Peterson, leaving behind a tangle of bloody limbs. Peterson, I won't describe what I saw. The thing got him good. Ripped him apart, drank from him. We don't carry field medics on our missions, and it wouldn't have mattered. Ramirez and Evans arrived. Ramirez helped me drag Peterson's ruined body into a dip in the rocks for some semblance of a burial. We didn't say much. Peterson, the tech whiz, our lifeline back to base, was gone. I was in charge now. Should I call it off? Get the hell out of there? No, fury burned in me. That thing was out there, still hunting. We had to stop it. We followed the tracks further, Evans collecting samples of blood she couldn't identify, Ramirez grim-faced, and me seeing Peterson's death every time I blinked. 
By nightfall, the tracks led us to a cave, a black hole in the side of a cliff. I don't like this, Ramirez muttered. Well, tough, cause we're going in. I snapped, reckless and angry. Inside the cave, it stank. Damp, moldy, something else, rotten. We flicked on our helmet flashlights, creating a tunnel of light in the darkness. The cave wound downwards. The tracks were fresh here, clearer marks in the soft earth. Evans took more samples, muttering something about troglobites, things that adapt to absolute darkness. Whatever this creature was, it had been down here a long, long time. We descended deeper. The air grew clammy, and I had that unsettling tingle at the back of my neck, the feeling that something was watching us. Even Ramirez, usually so stoic, had his hand tight on his rifle. The cave opened into a larger chamber, a cathedral of twisted rock formations. And then I saw it. Not the spider thing. That had been some kind of horrific outlier, thank God. This creature stood in the center of the chamber. It was humanoid, the size of a large man. Long, emaciated limbs, skin almost translucent showing the network of veins and bones beneath. But its head. It was bald, the skull an elongated dome, tapering to a pointed chin with no discernible mouth. Where a human would have eyes were just smooth, blank sockets. It held something in its clawed hands, something small and bundled, emitting soft, whimpering cries. Oh my God! Evans whispered, horrified. The creature was hunched over, protectively. Then I realized, the bundle wasn't animal prey. It was a human child, a toddler at most. Filthy, thin, but alive. It stared up at the monster with big, terrified eyes. It, it took a kid, Ramirez choked out. He raised his rifle. I hesitated, a thousand conflicting thoughts crashing through my head. The creature looked up, sensing our presence. Its head tilted in that oddly bird-like way. Then, it dropped the child and lunged at us with impossible speed. There was a blur of movement, the crack of Ramirez's rifle, and a guttural scream echoing in the cave. Retreat! I yelled. We scrambled back up the narrow tunnel, firing blindly. The thing was behind us, its shrieks bouncing off the rock walls. Evan stumbled, losing her footing. I turned back, saw the creature close in extending its long arm with its impossibly sharp claws. I fired, more out of desperation than strategy. There was a screech, the sound of something tearing. Evan screamed, but the creature was gone, retreating deeper into the cave. I reached down, hauled Evans to her feet. We staggered out, into the fading desert light, leaving a trail of blood behind us. Evan's leg was a mess. The claws had ripped through muscle, narrowly missing bone. We patched her up as best we could, adrenaline finally wearing off, leaving us shaking and hollow. There was no way we could pursue that thing, not now. But I knew it was still down there, waiting, with its child captive. Reaching base was a grueling ordeal. My report was a jumbled mess of half-truths and omissions. Peterson's death was logged as an animal attack, Ramirez and I marked as injured during a routine patrol. Evans, pale and haunted, refused to speak about what she'd seen. It was all covered up, as usual. They told us to go home, to rest and recover. Recover, yeah, right. They offered counseling, the kind designed to erase memories, to make obedient soldiers out of traumatized survivors. I refused. Some things you can't forget, even if you want to. Ramirez quit soon after. Disappeared off the grid, trying to find his own kind of peace, I guess. Evans took a long leave, 
and I didn't blame her. Me, I couldn't walk away. I requested another assignment, this time up north. Heard there were disappearances in the Alaskan wilderness, bears behaving strangely, hunters vanishing. Sound familiar? I started packing my bags. The duffel was standard issue, the guns government sanctioned. But among the supplies I stashed away were a few things off the books. A homemade UV flashlight, a vial of liquid silver, a worn book filled with sketches of creatures that don't officially exist. My own little hunter's toolkit. This time, it's personal. Yeah, I still do the job, neutralize those threats to national security. I follow orders, otherwise they shut you down quick. But somewhere out there in the shadows, that cave creature exists. Maybe it's alone, maybe it's one of many. Doesn't matter. I won't stop until I find it. Until I rescue that child, or avenge it. Until I finally put a bullet in the brain of that eyeless, pointy-headed bastard. Because that's the thing about monsters, the real ones anyway. They don't just disappear. And neither do the people who hunt them. Months later, I stood near a remote Alaskan outpost, rifle cradled in my arms, watching the snow swirl. Ramirez had once told me an old Apache legend about hunters turning into the thing they chased too long. Maybe he was right. I didn't care. The cold had settled into my bones, a different kind of chill than the Arizona desert, but the same kind of determination fueled me. My radio crackled. It was base, with news of a mangled body found half-buried in the ice, a missing logger with strange puncture wounds on his torso. Looks like my hunt had just begun. My name is Caden Harris, and this happened to me on November 7, 1991. Back then, I worked the kind of job folks don't like to talk about, the kind where you see things, learn things, that would break most people. I'm a dad now, got a little girl to protect, so I put that life behind me. But I still remember that fall, up in the remote forests of the Olympic Peninsula. They sent my team in blind. Bunch of hikers vanished without a trace. No remains. No ransom notes. Nothing. Standard protocol. Sweep the area. Look for any sign of foul play. Report back. We were four strong. Me, the point man. Novak, the techie. Jensen, the old-timer. And Wright, the rookie fresh out of training. The Olympic Peninsula is something else. Rainforest so thick the sun barely filters through, old-growth trees like giants, the air always damp and heavy. We made camp near an old logging road, figuring that's where folks would stray from. Days crept by, long and quiet. Set up camera traps, took soil samples, the usual drill. Found nothing out of the ordinary, and that was starting to get weirder than any monster sighting would have been. Then came the noises. At night, at first. Low growls, echoing in the darkness. Things snapping branches out in the black woods. Made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. The rookie, right, started getting spooked. We told him it was probably just a bear, but nobody was really convinced, not even Jensen with all his years dealing with the strange and unusual. One morning, Jensen didn't come back from his perimeter check. We found his rifle discarded on the forest floor, but no sign of him. Novak, face pale, showed us his tracker. Jensen's signal just winked off the map. That's when the dread set in, that gut feeling that something was way, way wrong out there. We radioed command. No backup was coming. Not until there was proof of something worth sending in a whole strike team. Great. We were on our own, down a man, 
and facing something that snatched a groan, armed veteran without leaving a trace. Novak swore he was picking up movement on his thermal scans, something big, lurking just at the edge of the tree line. I didn't need fancy gadgets to tell me we were being watched. We hunkered down in camp, trying to form a plan. Wright was on the verge of a breakdown, babbling prayers under his breath. The sun started to set, casting long, creepy shadows, and tension in the camp ratcheted up to breaking point. Night fell, heavy and moonless. We huddled close to the fire, guns loaded, senses straining out into the darkness. Then I smelled it, a rank, rotten stench, like old meat left in the sun. Wright whimpered, and my stomach clenched. And then the thing moved out from the trees. It was massive, easily eight feet tall, stooped like an ape, but with a lean, hungry build. Its skin was leathery, stretched tight over bulging muscles, covered in coarse, gray fur. But the worst were the eyes. Cold, intelligent, like something ancient sized us up and decided we were the next course on the menu. I yelled. We opened fire. The bullets ripped into the thing, but it just staggered, roared a challenge that set my teeth on edge. Novak fumbled for a grenade. That's when the thing lashed out, faster than anything its size had any right to be. It snatched right. One second he was there, screaming. The next, just a smear of blood and a tattered piece of his uniform in the flickering firelight. I yelled at Jensen and Novak to fall back. We bolted through the trees, boots slipping on the mossy forest floor, the thing's guttural growls echoing behind us. We didn't stop until we stumbled out onto the logging road, chest heaving, hearts pounding. Then Novak collapsed, choking out. The tracker... Jensen's signal was back on the map. He was moving, fast, deeper into the trees, away from us. I wanted to go after him. But that thing was out there, and we were outgunned, outmatched. In that moment, I made the call. Left Jensen out there, radioed for extraction, and told one hell of a lie to the brass about a bear attack. They bought it, or pretended to classified the whole damn incident. Never saw Jensen again. Don't know if that thing killed him, or if he's still out there. I left the unit a few years back, moved to the suburbs, started a family. But at night, sometimes, I look out the window into the backyard shadows, and I swear I feel the weight of those cold eyes on me, watching and waiting. This happened to me on June 14, 2002, back when I was a rookie deputy with the Sheriff's Department in Alpine, Texas. A dusty, small town, right on the edge of the sprawling Chihuahuan desert miles of rocks, sand, and the occasional stubborn cactus. I'm Sam Carter. Always loved it here, despite the heat and boredom. Seemed like I'd spend my whole career handling cattle disputes and the occasional drunk and disorderly. This call was different. Mrs. Montoya, an elderly woman who lives out at the edge of town, reports hearing screams coming from the desert wash behind her property. Now, these desert arroyos are treacherous, especially after dark. Flash floods can sweep through without warning. Mrs. Montoya's worried one of those migrant groups crossing the border might be in trouble. Roll my eyes, but hey, it's my job. It's already close to sundown when I pull up to Mrs. Montoya's little adobe house. She's waiting on the porch, wringing her hands. Gives me another earful about the screams. I take a deep breath, trying to stay patient. Ma'am, could have been coyotes or maybe some kids messing around. But she's adamant, swears she knows what human screams sound like, swears someone's out there and needs help. 
Something about her earnestness gives me pause. Hike out back, following the line of the dry wash, flashlight weaving in the gathering gloom. The desert looks different at night, shadows playing tricks on the eyes. Every rustle of dry brush sounds magnified. Still, I find myself calling out, figuring if someone is stuck in the wash, I want them to know helps here. No answer, just the low howl of the desert wind. I'm about to head back and tell Mrs. Montoya I didn't find anything when I hear it. A scream, faint, but definitely human this time. And it sounds like it's coming from below me. Shine my flashlight into the wash. It drops about eight feet to a sandy creek bed. And that's when I see the opening. A cave, or maybe a mine shaft, half concealed by a tumble of rocks. Didn't even notice it when it was light out. The scream echoes again, muffled and desperate. Pull out my radio and call it in, but there's just static. Must be the interference from the hills. I curse under my breath. Then again, if there was an injured person, they didn't sound like they'd last long out there alone. Decision made, I climb down into the wash. The cave mouth is narrow, only a few feet high. I crouch low and shine my flashlight inside. It's damp and stale smelling, with an earthen floor and rough-hewn walls. My heart starts pounding. There's something wrong here, something my gut says isn't right. But the screams echo again, closer this time. I take a deep breath and push my way in. The tunnel slopes down, twisting and turning for what feels like forever. Must have been some old mine that collapsed, judging by the crumbling support beams. The air grows thin, making me gasp for breath. And then, up ahead I see a faint light, a pale, sickly yellow. My legs feel like lead but I push on, drawn by those cries for help. Round a bend in the tunnel, and it opens out slightly. I stop dead. It's hard to see at first, the light pulsating strangely. Then my eyes adjust, and a wave of horror washes over me. In the center of a small chamber, a group of people, but that's not quite the right word. Creatures. Hulking and misshapen, squatting on their haunches with skin stretched tight over bone like nothing human I've ever seen. They're hunched over something in the center of the chamber, a mangled body, barely recognizable. It takes me a moment to process the blood, the, the feast they're having. One of them looks up, straight at me. Its eyes glow a fiery orange in the dimness, its mouth twists into a snarl of needle-like teeth. I stumble back, screaming involuntarily. Behind me, I hear the scrabbling of feet on stone. I turn and run. I don't remember much about the climb back out of the wash, just blind, desperate scrambling, half expecting to feel claws rip into my back. Finally, I stumble out into the open, gasping for air, and see Mrs. Montoya standing aghast a few feet away. I open my mouth to warn her, to tell her to run but the words catch in my throat. There, silhouetted against the twilight, emerging from the cave are the creatures. They move with unnatural speed, bounding across the sand. Mrs. Montoya screams. I reach for my gun, but my hands fumble. Time seems to slow as I draw my weapon. I don't think, just fire. The shots echo in the stillness, but the creatures keep coming. Mrs. Montoya bolts toward her house, but one of the creatures is too fast. It leaps, knocking her to the ground, raking its claws across her back. She cries out in pain, a high, keening wail cut short as the creature lunges for her throat. Panic turns to cold fury. I fire again, and another creature staggers. But they keep coming. My heart pounds like a trip hammer a roar of blood in my ears. Out of the corner of my eye, I see a glint of metal, 
an old mining pickaxe, discarded near the cave entrance. I lunge, snatching it. One of the creatures closes in. I swing the pickaxe with everything I have, feeling the impact reverberate through my arms as it cleaves into leathery hide and bone. The creature yells and collapses, spraying black blood across the sand. But there are more. So many more. I backpedal, swinging the pickaxe wildly, trying to keep them at bay. My gun's empty, but I barely notice, lost in a haze of adrenaline and primal terror. A sharp pain lances through my ankle as something tears into my flesh. I stumble, falling backwards, and the world explodes in a kaleidoscope of fangs and claws. Then, a sound cuts through the frenzy, the roar of an engine. Headlights blaze over the crest of a hill, tires screeching. It's back up. I hear shouts, more gunshots, and the creatures falter. Some scatter back towards the cave, others slump to the ground. The rest of it blurs, paramedics swarming around me, the sharp sting of disinfectant, the echoing throb of the chopper blades taking me to the El Paso hospital. I drift in and out of consciousness, the faces of the creatures flashing behind my eyelids. The aftermath, it wasn't neat. The bodies I found disappeared overnight. Some government cleanup crew, I suspect. Explaining away the creature remains was trickier. They cooked up a story about a wild animal attack. Vet reports got fudged. Animal experts paid off. Mrs. Montoya, bless her, kept quiet in exchange for some hefty compensation. I spent weeks in the hospital, my leg in a cast, my nights haunted by nightmares. They wanted to give me therapy, hush it all up, label it PTSD. I refused. What I saw was real. I wasn't crazy, no matter how much they wanted to sweep it under the rug. When I finally got discharged, I didn't come back to Alpine. Tried being a deputy in El Paso, but it didn't fit. The city was too loud, the streets too crowded. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me, lurking just beyond the reach of the streetlights. Wound up buying a small ranch in West Texas, miles from anywhere. Got myself a couple of dogs for protection, big, mean ones. I keep a shotgun loaded and a searchlight handy. Sometimes, at night, I hear things in the brush. Sometimes, I swear I see eyes gleaming in the dark. But I'm ready. When the creatures come back, and they will, I'll be waiting. The doctors, the government, they think they buried the truth in that desert cave. But the truth doesn't stay buried. Some things you can't hide no matter how hard you try. I learned that out there in the wash. One night, you might see it on the news. Rancher repels feral animal attack. Only I'll know what the reports don't say. What the news anchors with their concerned voices and sympathetic smiles don't understand. I wasn't fighting wild animals. I was fighting something older, darker. A reminder that out there, in the shadows beyond the edge of our civilized world, monsters are real. And they're hungry. This happened to me on June 16, 1999. I still remember the date vividly, clear as day. It's hard not to. My name's Mark Langley, been with the Birchwood Police for about 13 years now. A small town out near the fringes of the Ozark National Forest, that's Birchwood. It's the sort of place where everyone knows everyone, and nothing much ever happens. That, of course, was before the summer of 99. See, growing up near wilderness meant I was no stranger to animal encounters. Even big ones. Bears, mountain lions, you name it. Nothing ever caused serious problems, 
not until that summer. Calls started coming in about missing livestock. Strange disappearances in the night. Some folks mentioned mutilated carcasses, though I put that down to scavenger animals having a feast. Then, it was missing pets. Dogs mostly, even a few cats. That was disturbing. It made everyone uneasy, like there was something wrong, something off. Tension hung heavy in the air, folks whispering and locking their doors a little tighter each night. Some even started arming themselves. Things escalated rapidly when Billy Jenkins, a kid of about fourteen, vanished from his yard one evening. Played outside a bit past dusk, and when his mom called him in, he was gone. Not a trace. We organized search parties, combed the woods, but nothing. No Billy, no signs of struggle, nothing. I was part of the team that searched his room. You never truly understand what a missing kid means until you see their empty bed, toys scattered like they were there a second ago. Heartbreaking. His mom was devastated, of course. Mr. Jenkins swore he'd find Billy himself, blamed us for not doing enough. That wasn't true though we threw everything we had at it. Then, a little over a week after Billy vanished, it was old Miss Florence. Sweet old lady, everyone's favorite grandma in a way. Found half her remains half-eaten near the creek by some fishing kids. It was bad. Like nothing I ever saw before. That was when I got the call that set things in motion. Dispatch said Randall Hayes, another officer, spotted something large and unidentified on his patrol along County Road 12. I headed out there immediately. Randall was waiting, his face pale. I don't know what that thing was, he said, pointing into the trees. He described something tall, lanky, moving impossibly fast. He got a partial glance, just enough to realize it wasn't any bear or cat he'd ever seen. I went in gun-drawn. Randall had marked where it disappeared into the thick brush. It was quiet, that eerie silence only the deep woods produce. Every rustle of leaves made me jump. Then I saw it. A pair of eyes, glowing yellow in the dim light. Too high for a normal animal. The shape behind them was wrong, warped. It moved when I did, swaying side to side, almost curious. I tried to get a proper look, but the trees were dense, the light fading. Come on out, I said, keeping my gun trained on the spot. The thing made a sound then. A low hiss, nothing like I'd heard from any living creature. It sounded predatory. A shiver ran down my spine. I fired a shot into the air, more as a warning than anything else. The thing shrieked, a terrible sound that echoed through the trees. Then it was gone. No crashing branches, no sounds of retreat, just vanished into thin air. I reported what I saw, but the chief was hesitant to escalate things. Small town budgets and all that. The townsfolk, though, that was a different story. Fear turned to fury. They started to organize to hunt wanted to wipe out whatever was doing this. The next night, that's when it found me. I was on patrol, same general area. Saw a flicker of movement in the rear view. When I turned, there it was. That same awful thing, silhouetted against the road. I slammed on the brakes, got out of the car, gun raised. It crouched low, those eyes reflecting my headlights. Then it stood. It must have been eight feet tall, thin as a rail. Long arms dangled, nearly brushing the asphalt, ending in razor-sharp claws. The face, that's what haunts me the most. Stretched and wide, full of sharp, jagged teeth. No fur, just pale, sickly skin pulled taut. Before I could process what I was seeing and moved, blindingly fast, like it teleported. 
One second it was twenty feet away, then its claws were raking down my chest, knocking me to the ground. Pain exploded through me. I couldn't think straight, only fire and blood and those teeth closing in. I kicked out, landing a hard blow on something solid. The creature shrieked, stumbling backward. I scrambled to my feet, aimed blind as tears ran down my face. I pulled the trigger, again and again, the sound of the gunshots deafening in the night. There was a wail, a cracking of branches, and it was gone. I collapsed there on the road. My side was a mess, my shirt soaked in blood. Radio was a blur as I called for backup for an ambulance. I barely remember the rest of that night. The hospital, stitched up, pain meds kicking in. The higher-ups got involved after that. State police, some conservation folks. Nobody found a damn thing. Officially, my report was filed as an animal attack. Most still think a bear did it. I know better. They covered it up, of course. Couldn't have folks panicking about unknown monsters in the woods. Sometimes, ignorance is safer, I suppose. They say I was lucky. That and my quick thinking saved my life. I don't feel so lucky. Scars ain't just physical. Some nights, mostly when the woods are real quiet, I swear I can hear that awful shriek echoing in the distance. And I wonder, will it come back for me? This happened to me about a decade ago when I decided to visit the quaint little town of Harmony Falls, located deep within the Appalachian Mountains. My name is Jasper Thompson, and at the time, I was seeking solace after a rough divorce. I craved tranquility and natural splendor. Upon arriving in Harmony Falls, I checked into a charming bed and breakfast. The locals were friendly always stopping to chat and share any interesting tidbits about their town. One morning at breakfast, I met an older couple named Virgil and Edna Quimby who spoke about their grandson who had gone missing in the surrounding mountains only two weeks prior. Concerned, I asked more about the circumstances and what search efforts had been made. They disclosed that several locals had also vanished without a trace in recent months authorities baffled as to the cause. A heavy cloud of sorrow hung over these once joyful people. My wanderlust peaked. I set out on a hike through the idyllic mountains surrounding the town with my trusty camera in hand. With each step further into the dense forest, a growing sense of unease began to envelop me, as if something other than birds were watching from above. A few miles into my hike, an overpowering stench invaded my nostrils. Following this putrid scent led me to a gruesome sight, an abandoned homestead littered with the unmistakable remnants of human bodies torn apart by some vicious force. Overwhelmed by nausea and terror, I choked back bile as my legs gave way beneath me. I scrambled back into town, praying that someone would be able to explain this horrifying discovery. The townsfolk stared blankly at my panicked recounting of events before revealing that they believed cannibalistic mountain men lurked within the regions beyond their homes, forgotten souls that hungered for human flesh. Gathering those willing to brave a search for our missing companions, we set out into the wilderness in pursuit of these malevolent adversaries. We were met with shocking aftermaths of their heinous crimes— mass graves hidden away and ominous signs taunting our return to Harmony Falls. Our party pressed onward, determined to end this reign of terror once and for all. Yet, every unexpected rustling in the bushes hinted at the presence of these elusive sadistic fiends. The tension mounted as conversation swirled around how these men could have descended into such unspeakable depravities. Days turned into weeks with no sightings, causing morale to wither amongst us. 
During a cold night when hope seemed lost, a scream echoed through camp. Our eyes opened to a terrifying scene, one of our own being dragged away into the darkness by wiry figures clothed in tattered rags. We pursued immediately, adrenaline pumping through our veins like hot lava. The sound of our friends' cries pierced my soul as we stumbled through thickets and underbrush in desperate pursuit of his captors. Impeded by the difficult terrain, we struggled to keep up with these swift predators. Mere glimpses of their haggard faces fueled our fire to rescue our comrade before he met the same fate as those who had come before him. The horrifying realization that our friend had been taken by the cannibalistic mountain men only fueled our determination to find him and put an end to their reign of terror. We followed the sounds of his cries, our hearts pounding as we sprinted through the dense forest. We tried calling for help, shouting into our walkie-talkies, but there was no response. The static noise indicated that we were too far away from civilization, and we knew that we were on our own. Finally, we stumbled upon a small clearing where we saw our friend bound and gagged, his captors standing around him with sinister grins plastered across their faces. The sight of the mountain men sent a shiver down my spine. They were covered in filth, their hair matted and unkempt. Their eyes were cold and dead as they stared at us with no fear, as if we were nothing but prey entering their territory. We've got you now, one of them sneered, brandishing a blood-stained knife. Intruders in our territory pay the price, another one growled, his voice low and guttural. Our group hesitated, unsure of what our next move should be. If we attacked them head-on, we stood no chance against their numbers and brute strength. On the other hand, if we fled without attempting a rescue, our friend would surely become their next meal. We took a gamble. One of us managed to find a large rock by the side and threw it at one of the cannibals with full force. The rock struck him straight in the face causing him to stagger backward in pain. Seeing an opening for escape, I whispered encouragingly to my team before charging towards them with all the courage I could muster. Our desperation drove us forward and gave us temporary strength against seemingly insurmountable odds. Together we fought and clawed at them while trying to create a path that leads to our captured friend. The sounds of the fight were overwhelming with grunts, shouts, and the crunch of bone meeting flesh. Despite our best efforts, we lost two of our team to the cannibals' swift and brutal attacks. We needed a new strategy and fast. We noticed an overhanging branch nearby with the potential to topple directly onto the mountain men. With wild abandon, we focused our attention on bringing it down to create a diversion long enough for us to free our friend. With a loud crash, the branch fell onto several of the cannibals, causing them to scream out in pain. In that moment of chaos, we made our move. We hurriedly untied our friend and helped him back onto his feet. Run! I shouted, and as a group, we turned and sprinted back into the dense forest with renewed hope. The remaining mountain men roared behind us in anger at losing their prey but did not give chase. It seemed they had decided that it was not worth pursuing us further into their territory, as they were no longer guaranteed an easy kill. Through sheer exhaustion, we managed to make it back to Harmony Falls, shaken by what had happened but grateful to be alive. The gruesome sight of the campsite still burned fresh in my mind as we reported all that had occurred over these past weeks to the authorities. Our lost team members will forever live in our memories, their courage and bravery inspiring us during some of our darkest moments. In the days that followed, a plan was set forth to deal with these deranged mountain men once and for all. We could not let them continue their reign of terror unchecked not after witnessing firsthand the depravity they were capable of. 
authorities went forth into the wilderness with an avalanche of resources to ensure no stone remained unturned in their pursuit for justice. The group was captured, brought to trial, and sentenced for their despicable actions. Despite the darkness we had all faced, the strength of coming together to put an end to their evil held a sense of bittersweet victory that would never be forgotten. I had just arrived from my shift at the fire lookout in Gila National Forest, nestled in the rocky highlands of New Mexico. My name is Nolan, not that anyone around here would remember it. I was given a brief and distant welcome before being left alone with the vast wilderness. My job was to watch for fires and report any signs of smoke among the tangle of trees and dry brush below. The isolation didn't bother me much. There's comfort and solitude if you're used to it. I settled into my routine, scanning the horizon with binoculars and making log entries, when something down in a canyon caught my eye. It wasn't fire. It was an unnatural stillness. A group of hikers had gathered in a circle, which by itself wasn't unusual, but the limp figure they surrounded was... Calling on the radio yielded no response, so I hastily descended the tower on foot to investigate, my heart pounding against my chest not from exertion but from a cold swathe of fear. When I reached the site, the hikers were nowhere in sight. In their place lay a backpacker, his body contorted badly, the handiwork of something brutal. Overhead, buzzards circled like morbid spectators, yet there were no tracks, not even blood. It was as if he'd been dropped from a great height. The next few days were tense as local authorities combed through the area. But they found nothing to explain what happened. As night closed around my lookout once more, I noticed movement at twilight, the outline of an impossibly large coyote prancing along a ridge. Yelling out did nothing but amuse it. It glanced towards me with an unnerving intelligence before disappearing from view. Each night after, I would see it lurking just beyond reach. It was stalking something or someone. Its behavior seemed both random and calculated at the same time. One evening as shadows stretched across the forest floor like dark fingers clawing at the earth, I heard laughter human laughter mingling with that creature's howls. It sent chills down my limbs and locked up my throat with fear. The sound echoed into nothingness just as quickly as it had started. The laughter continued intermittently over days. It seemed friendly yet foreign as if someone, or something, was using humor as a mask for something more sinister. One dust-tipped morning brought tourists asking about hiking trails. Among them was a Lara woman whose smile strained under an invisible weight. I felt her unease almost instantly when she mentioned seeing an odd dog watching her campsite at night. The pieces started falling into place too late as our eyes met. Realization dawned on her features too. That thing out there wasn't hunting randomly. It had been preying upon any who delved too deeply into its domain. The coyote showed itself once more as though bidding farewell or perhaps signaling its apex move in this macabre game. I cannot tell which. We retreated behind heavy timber doors that night, listening to scraping sounds outside against wood and rock alike. With each passing hour came new terrors thinking about what comes next, what it could do with human cunning paired with feral instinct. The night after the tourists arrived, we found our answer. Alara came to me, her eyes wide with fear. She whispered that she had seen the creature again, this time clearer than before. In the low light of dusk, its form was unmistakable. The size of a large dog but with the posture of something predatory, its fur matted in places like dreadlocks from an unkempt beard. Its eyes reflected a cunning intelligence, not gleaming with any light that should be there. 
We banned all hiking after dark. Yet, despite the danger, I understood why we didn't call for help. Who would believe us without proof? And what help could be offered against a creature we knew nothing about? Two nights later screams shattered our fragile peace. We rushed out to find the tourists, panic ridden on their faces as they recounted a gruesome sight. One of their own lay mangled near the edge of the forest where no human would wander without cause. Body torn, it looked less like an animal attack and more like a show of power, a statement. We stayed indoors at night after that, advising others to do so as well until daylight graced us once again, an unwritten truce between us and it. On the fifth day since the tourist's arrival, it escalated. The creature attacked in plain sight, quick and brutal. It targeted another tourist, a man this time, its teeth sinking into his flesh with precision that left no room for survival. Authorities arrived soon after, questions asked and reports filed, but no answers provided that could ease our unsettled minds. They left as quickly as they had come. The town was now marked by those lost to the beast's inexplicable vendetta. The tourists departed soon after, not wanting to tempt fate any more than they already had. I still stand watch at night sometimes, peering into the darkness beyond my window, into its realm. Safety feels provisional, a thin veneer that could shatter at any given moment. The laughter fades from memory now, a haunting prelude to terror that visited our doorstep. And though actions spoke louder than fears ever could, we spoke of it less and less hoping silence would steal away its power or at least the memory of those dark days when death walked brazenly under twilight skies. In whispers and quiet prayers, we remembered those who died, not by name but by shared loss. Their presence felt like echoes in our careful steps and wary glances towards the woods. There were no goodbyes, only a continuous struggle for another dawn alive but scarred by knowledge too dangerous to ignore. The thing in the forest lurked still, this we felt with certainty, one was shadow and dread, an apex predator in our midst, defying reason and untouched by human hardship, it waits. And so ends my recollection, no triumph or conclusion within grasp. Only hope for respite under days, comforting light and respect for the power nature conceals within its depths. I remember the air that morning. It was biting, a chill that seemed eager to linger over the pines which scrapes the skies around Humboldt County's lush expanse. My job as a fire lookout situated me atop a lonely tower, my eyes perpetually scanning for smokes or flames that dared defile this verdant sanctuary. My name is Arlen Keane. Firefighting ran in my blood, passed down from generations who also stood sentinel over these woods, but my passion lay in the tranquility of isolation. The solitude suited me after all life had thrown my way. A marriage turned to ash and friendships smoldered out from prolonged absence. One morning, disruption found its way to my otherwise methodical routine. Passing hikers would sometimes wander near the base of my tower, their voices usually bubbling up faintly before dissipating into the ether. That day, however, it was silence that clawed at me, ominous and heavy. The sun dipped low when I resolved to descend and investigate. Trekking through underbrush, each stride brought me closer to an unspeakable sight, scraps of a campsite marred by violence. Belongings scattered and shredded, crimson smeared across rocks, but no bodies. No signs of any creatures either, just the aftermath of an unknown terror. Back in my watchtower, sleep refused to claim me. The stillness now felt suffocating rather than serene. Days stretched on, but those hikers never re-emerged from whatever fate had befallen them. In time, rumors suffused the nearby towns, 
Talk of an elusive predator stalking through these parts with cunning intellect and brutality unlike any known animal of this region. Tracker Jasper Milone even claimed to have glimpsed it once through his binoculars at dawn, beastly in silhouette yet moving with purposeful grace. Neither wolf nor bear, a mystery without a name. Night fell again like cascading dominoes and another anomalous occurrence visited. A rapping on my tower's door below so deliberate it couldn't be the work of wind or whimsical fauna. Peering from high above down into darkness, nothing visible but the endless dance of nocturnal life. This persisted nights on end, each knocking hastening heartbeats while whittling away at resolve. Simple explanations eluded me. The terrain was treacherous at night for humans and uncharacteristic for animals known to roam these woods. Then one dusk, as hues faded from violet to black, I sighted it a figure emerging from between trunks with deliberation that was nearly human. Hairy but erect in stature it approached, evading clear view behind thickets and trees as if aware of prying eyes. Descending once more I reached the aftermath just after daybreak, ovoid impressions imprinted within Earth's skin where I had spotted the enigmatic visitor the prior nightfall. All this said against vocal murmurings from townsfolk debating myths and loggers swearing off areas now deemed accursed. The next night, I sat in the tower, radio in hand. I debated calling for help but hesitated. The creature's nature and intent remained unknown, likely to be met with disbelief. Again knocking echoed from below, pacing with consistent rhythm. I wouldn't leave the safety of my post to confront it. Instead, I monitored the forest through my window, gripping the radio tightly. Suddenly, an unmistakable figure lunged into view. The creature was immense, a mass of muscle beneath matted fur that glistened under the moonlight. Its eyes glowed with a hunger that pierced the darkness. Townsfolk whispered of lost friends while searching during daylight but found nothing aside from peculiar tracks matching the size I'd witnessed. When dusk approached, people secured their homes and looked over their shoulders. On the fourth night, shrieks erupted from the edge of town. The beast had struck reducing once vibrant lives to silence. In its wake, Daniel Gresham was found lifeless, torn beyond recognition. I finally took action and made calls reporting aggression and providing descriptions but avoided speculation about what it could be. Help arrived as trackers equipped to deal with large predators. They found evidence confirming a massive unknown animal prowling these parts with tactics showcasing unsettling intelligence. The attack ceased once traps and hunters lined the woods. Still no capture occurred. In time, people cautiously resumed daily routines, but memories lingered of those taken by the phantom predator whose existence questioned our understanding of these woods. A silent agreement settled among us to watch diligently, especially when darkness fell upon us again. And so life went on, marked by watchful eyes and whispers of a beast threaded into regional lore though never fully explained nor ever seen again after that fateful week of terror a stark reminder to respect boundaries between humankind and nature's unseen realms. This happened to me on June 6, 2002, just outside of Reno, Nevada. Back then, I was still green behind the ears Officer Brady Holt fresh out of the academy, thinking I knew everything. Reno wasn't the big city, but coming from a place where the most action we got was a bar brawl on a Saturday night, well, it felt like a different world. Funny thing about this job is how fast the ordinary can turn sideways. One minute you're dealing with broken taillights, the next you're staring down the wrong end of a barrel. Mine went sideways answering a call about a domestic disturbance out on Pyramid Lake Highway. Now, Pyramid Lake itself is a bit of a local oddity. 
big, saline lake out in the Nevada desert, surrounded by these weird rock formations that jut up like fingers. The Paiute have legends about it. Something about water babies and battles with giants always dismissed those as tall tales figured they were probably talking about catfish the size of canoes. Should have paid more attention, maybe. I arrive at this ramshackle trailer park just as the sun's setting, casting a fiery glow over the whole desolate landscape. Place gives me the creeps, paint-peeled trailers, mangy dogs tied to stakes, the kind of quiet that tells you everyone's watching, even if you don't see a soul. The call came from Trailer 5, a battered old thing with a flickering porch light. I knock, announce myself, the whole nine yards. Silence. I try the handle, and surprise, surprise, it's unlocked. Hello? Reno PD, anyone home? I step inside the hair on the back of my neck standing on end. The smell hits me first stale beer, something rotten underneath, like old meat left out in the sun. I flick on my flashlight, the beam cutting through a haze of cigarette smoke. The place is a wreck, beer cans everywhere, clothes strewn about, an overturned table in the living room. Then I see them, on the floor near the kitchen. A woman and a man, they're beyond dead. It's a bloodbath. Clothes torn bodies. Jesus, it looks like something went at them with a hatchet. I choke back bile, call it in, my voice high and tight. It takes every ounce of self-control not to turn and run back out into the desert twilight. Back up arrives, Henderson, a grizzled old-timer with a tobacco-stained mustache. He doesn't flinch at the scene, just takes one look and sighs. Animals, he mutters. Only animals do this. That word echoes in my head, animals. Cause there's no way a human, not even the most strung out meth head, could do this kind of damage. The wounds aren't clean, they're ragged, ripped with brute force. We process the scene the forensic skies picking over every inch the way they do. I'm mostly on crowd control, keeping the gawkers from the trailer park out. Don't want them trampling evidence or, worse, giving themselves nightmares they'll never shake. Henderson finds me later, leaning against the hood of my cruiser, staring over the bleak landscape. He doesn't say a word, just hands me a thermos of coffee, black and bitter the way I like it. You ever seen anything like that, kid? He gestures vaguely towards the trailer, the porch light casting long shadows of the crime scene text still inside. I haven't seen much of anything, sir. I take a sip of the coffee, the warmth spreading through me, doing nothing to chase away the cold settling in my bones. He snorts. Well, let's hope you never do again. I've been on the force twenty years, thought I'd seen the worst folks could offer up. But this... He shakes his head slowly. It gets dark fast out there in the desert. The stars come out, bright and cold, and the rocks around Pyramid Lake turn into hulking silhouettes against the skyline. There's a rustling sound down by the shoreline, sets my nerves on edge. Henderson notices. Probably coyotes, he says, not sounding convinced. Coyotes don't tear folks to pieces, sir. I say, the words catching in my throat. And that's when we see it, a shadow against the starlight, slinking along the edge of the trailer park. It's big, easily the size of a bear, but it moves different, too low to the ground, too slinky. We both reach for our sidearms on instinct. Stay here, Henderson snaps, the order somehow even more terrifying than the shadowed beast lurking just beyond our sight. He steps off into the darkness, gun drawn, a lone figure against the vastness of the night. I hear a shout, a growl that makes the hair on my arms stand straight up in human, a noise from the back of the throat, raw with hunger and fury. Then there are gunshots, 
echoing in the desert silence. The shadowed thing lets out a screech, piercing and shrill, before fading into a series of retreating thumps. A flashlight beam cuts through the darkness. It's Henderson, stumbling back towards me, face pale. What the hell was that? I ask, but he just shakes his head, breathing hard. Don't know, kid, and don't want to find out. Let's just get the hell out of here. The next day, the story's all over the news. Animal attack is the official line, probably a mountain lion that wandered too far down from the mountains. Folks in the trailer park are spooked, talking about locking their doors, buying bigger guns. Me? I don't say much, just keep seeing that hunched silhouette, those eyes burning like embers in the dark. I'm James Walton, and tonight I'm starting my shift at the undisclosed forest location in Alaska, where our covert task force has set up camp to track down an elusive and dangerous creature. Our unit specializes in hunting monsters that defy explanation and sometimes the laws of nature. The dense, snow-capped trees loom over us, and despite being surrounded by beauty, an eerie feeling lingers in the air. Our team consists of Maria Duran, a seasoned tracker with razor-sharp instincts, Felix Adair, a former marine sniper who's logged kills from impossible distances, and Carrie Simonson, our no-nonsense field medic who always packs extra sutures. As we gather around the campfire exchanging mild jokes to lighten the mood, Maria's laughter fades as she peers into the night. We've been receiving reports of unexplainable killings and disappearances in this area for months. The victims are left torn apart as if by a wild animal, but local wildlife experts have been baffled by what could cause such brutal damage. With each report, our unease grows. Something unheard of is out there. While scanning our surroundings with thermal cameras and listening to faint noises from the woods, Felix's clammy hands shake not from the cold but from anticipation mixed with uncertainty. His reluctance to admit his fears creates a heavy silence that covers us like a thick layer of snow. Felix suddenly jerks his head, staring at something on his screen. James, he whispers urgently. I think I see movement, two heat signatures moving together. Maria inches closer to assist. The closer we get to whatever beast is lurking in these woods— I can't help but recall my uncle who raised me after my parents died. He always said that natural predators rarely attack humans unless provoked or desperate. But whatever we're dealing with here isn't natural. Peering through the darkness of the forest, we strain our eyes for any sign of movement or the slightest sound that doesn't belong. We inch forward silently, our ears and instincts guiding us more than our eyes. Suddenly, Maria signals us to stop with a single raised hand. She's heard something that makes her uneasy. Murmurs of potential help start to brew among us, but she silences us with a wave. It's clear that she believes making radio contact could attract unwanted attention. As we push through the frozen underbrush, we hear heavy breathing and snarls closing in from all directions. The mere act of sensing this creature's presence sends shudders down my spine. I've faced many monsters throughout my career, but none quite as unexplainable as this one. Before we know it, almighty growls and thunderous footsteps echo all around us as we spot a massive figure charging towards Felix from the shadows. Carrie tackles him out of harm's way as massive claws rip through the space Felix occupied just moments before. Our hearts race as the unknown terror, a large quadruped beast with coarse fur and savage teeth looming out from an elongated snout, circles around keenly hunting its next prey. I reach for my gun, but the creature vanishes into the underbrush before I can get a steady aim. Panic cries fill the air. Carrie insists it bit her arm. Blood oozes from her wound, heavier than anything I've seen before. Steadying herself against Maria's shoulder, 
she uses her remaining strength to suppress her agony. We know we can't willingly invite back up into this chaos without risking even more lives. Paradise morphs into purgatory. Snow flurries lash at us like shards of glass, slicing away our resolve and composure. A familiar ringing grows loud in my ears as reality overwhelms me. I ready my weapon defensively and lock eyes with Maria, who, having steeled herself for battle, charges into the shadows. Felix and I trail behind with our nerves on edge and eyes wide open. For one fleeting moment, I glance back at our injured Carrie and can't help but wish I'd had a chance to hear more about her life. As the terror grows stronger still, our desperation thuds in tow with each thunderous heartbeat. The creature seems to know that we're not prepared for its ungodly power and cunning. We move forward into the darkness, the guttural roars of the monster growing closer. With every step through the undergrowth, I keep my ears perked for any signs of the monstrous creature. We barely catch glimpses of it as it stalks us relentlessly. Felix audibly gasps, and I follow his gaze to find Carrie lying on the ground, her arm seeping a slowly spreading pool of blood. I grab my gun and shoot at the fleeing beast as it races back into the shadows. My attempt to subdue the creature seems futile as it evades our strikes with ease. We can't fight this thing, Maria shouts, panting. We need help. In a rare moment of respite, we fumble for our walkie-talkies to call for backup. Static crackles before we hear the voice of our fellow mercenary Henry responding nervously. We're coming your way. Stay put, he says. The question now is whether Henry's team will make it to us in time or become more casualties at the hands of this nightmare. Felix works quickly and efficiently to apply a tourniquet to Carrie's oozing wound. Thanks. She mumbles weakly, her face pale but her eyes determined. Moments later, we hear distant footsteps crashing through the forest and are relieved to see Henry's team approaching. They gasp when they take in Carrie's condition and immediately take over tending to her injuries. As they administer first aid, we exchange details of our horrifying encounter with this beast. We struggle to come up with any recognizable species matching its strange appearance and brutal behavior, which is unheard of in this region. It leaves us feeling deeply unsettled. Between us all, we strategize and devise a plan to try and trap the creature together, using a combination of weapons and teamwork. But even with our collective expertise and equipment, Doubt creeps into our minds as we question if any of it will be enough against this relentless predator. As we press forward, our bond with the mission falters in favor of survival instincts and the desire to protect one another. Suddenly, there's a guttural growl, and the creature leaps into our midst. Chaos ensues as we fight it with everything we have. Bullets fly, knives flash and cries of pain fill the air as each of us engages in desperate combat against the nightmare attacking us. Henry goes down first, claws slashing raking across his chest. The rest of us renew our offensive efforts against the monster, even as we witness Henry succumb to his wounds. Witnessing such cold brutality propels us further into the fight. Maria and I manage to flank the creature and wound it in unison. It roars in fury but shows signs of waning resolve. The others catch on to this and converge upon it. At last, our combined firepower seems to overwhelm the beast. It stumbles back, bleeding heavily from its wounds before collapsing lifelessly onto the forest floor. We all stare at its lifeless form silently, unsure if what we just experienced could ever be fully explained or understood. We turn to our fallen comrade, lifting him gently so as not to disturb what remains of his shattered body. His sacrifice ensured our victory over this unknown terror, a harrowing reminder that for all our strength and knowledge, there is always more that we can never truly be prepared for. As we make our way back with Carrie barely conscious and leaning on me for support, while she mourns Henry's loss under her breath, 
Our weariness is tinged with gratitude for surviving an ordeal far beyond what any of us could have fathomed. In time, I would learn more about Carrie, her aspirations, her fears. But in those moments, traversing back through that unforgiving landscape with a deceased friend in tow and a reality-defying beast defeated in our wake, our bonds were cemented in a most profound and unyielding sense of camaraderie. Words would do little to convey the experience. Yet, at the end of it all, we walked away wiser and more aware of what to expect when venturing into the unknown, that sometimes, the unthinkable hides in the shadows, waiting to challenge even the best among us. It was one of those times when I needed a break from the city life. My name's Reese Kilgore. I used to be a high school teacher before losing my job for reasons I'd rather keep to myself. Escaping to Elk Ridge, Wyoming offered me solace from the mess back home. It didn't take long for me to find a small, cozy cabin nestled in the woods nature at its finest. Upon entering the cabin... It was apparent the previous tenant had left in quite a hurry, furniture strewn about, food still on the table. I couldn't help but chuckle at their disorganization. Maybe they suddenly remembered they had somewhere else to be? While settling in, I met the neighbor from across the forest path, Eldritch Jarvis. I wasn't too too much into small talk but we exchanged pleasantries and he mentioned that we had both recently moved in looking for peace and quiet. Days went by and I found solace in hiking and exploring my surroundings. On one of my hikes, however, I stumbled upon a disastrous scene a rotting corpse. As panic rose within me, reality hit. Calling for help would lead investigators right to the mess I had left behind in the city. Burying that dreadful memory in my mind, I quickly hiked back to my cabin. The next day, while chopping wood outside, Eldritch appeared, visibly shaken and pale. He muttered about something that had attacked his cat last night, a creature with sharp claws and an eerie presence. Great. Now there were creepy beasts lurking around just what I wanted. As days turned into weeks an air of morbidity loomed over Elk Ridge. Disappearances were becoming frequent. Whispers of brutal killings spread around like wildfire. Each incident was marked with gut-wrenching details and frantic attempts to find who or what was wreaking havoc on this once peaceful retreat. Despite Eldritch's concerns about the town's chaos, I remained skeptical. It wasn't until a new neighbor from a distant cabin, Ambrose Zane, paid us a visit that fear finally took root in me. Ambrose shared his story of how he had crossed paths with an enormous, feral beast with matted hair and blood-stained claws. He managed to take cover in some bushes while the creature sniffed its way around him, only inches away. Though still hesitant to believe in this creature, I couldn't help but notice Eldritch's uneasiness growing stronger. With the tensions in Elk Ridge rising, we decided to form search parties with other neighbors to uncover whatever was behind these gruesome events. Things escalated when we found a mangled corpse further into the woods, fresh this time. The victim was virtually unrecognizable. His face had been shredded gruesomely, and his limbs were dismembered and scattered about. Imagery no one should ever witness— a palpable dread began to surround us as we searched deeper into the forest that evening. Our weapons gripped tightly, adrenaline coursing through our veins. The anticipation of finding this creature lurking within the darkness became overwhelming. As the group of neighbors and I continued our search, we stumbled upon a small clearing. In the dim moonlight, we peered beyond the tree line, straining to see any movement in the distance. One by one, members of our search party vanished deeper into the woods until only Eldritch, Ambrose, and I remained behind. We decided to call for help, 
hoping we could regroup with the others who were now enveloped by darkness. Our calls echoed through the silent forest, but none of our neighbors responded. Frustrated and fearful, Eldritch suggested splitting up. That way, we might have a better chance at finding whoever, or whatever, was responsible for these heinous acts. However, Ambrose disagreed with Eldritch's proposition. He thought separating would put us in greater danger. As our disagreement intensified, we failed to detect something creeping ever closer. It was only when a pungent smell filled our nostrils that Eldritch finally turned around. Before us loomed a massive creature resembling an enormous bear or a feral wolf but far more grotesque. Covered in matted hair slicked with blood and filth, its enormous claws dripped with what appeared to be fresh gore. Its malice seemed almost palpable as it bared its enormous teeth flecked in sinister grime. Eldritch screamed at us to run as the beast lunged towards him. The last thing I saw before turning on my heel was the immense creature swiping its enormous claws through Eldritch's torso as he fell forward with a guttural cry. My blood raced as Ambrose and I sprinted away from our assailant. We bolted down the moonlit path, dodging tree branches and thorny bushes that threatened to slow our rapid sprint. Although no one dared look back, it was clear we couldn't shake off this terror pursuing us relentlessly. The towering monster seemed content to stalk us, knowing it held command over our lives. A newfound horror dominated Elk Ridge, tearing apart our small community piece by piece. Curiosity ignited the creature's unwavering chase while keeping just outside of sight, leaving both neighbors and families on guard around the clock. There were no answers as to what this creature was or why it terrorized us so relentlessly. In our panic, Ambrose and I came to a cliff's edge, overlooking a vast and tumultuous river. As the last vestiges of hope vanished before us like smoke in the wind, the colossal beast closed in for its final attack. Our foe's red eyes burned like fire in the night, bloodlust overtaking its gaze. Ambrose and I knew we were cornered, and there was no way out. Neither one of us had any experience with gruesome anomalies like this. How could we? We were ordinary folk. As the grotesque beast bore down on us, we realized this would be our last stand. I looked at Ambrose with abject terror as all rational thought fled from my terrified mind. Then, piercing through the darkness came the blur of something flying straight at our monstrous adversary. In those last seconds before impact, I recognized a number of the search party members wielding flaming torches. The light seared into the creature's eyes as they thrust their fiery weapons forward, driving the monster back towards the forest's edge. As fear overtook its expression, I couldn't help but feel sympathy for this unhinged animal that had forsaken its own vibrant existence to haunt ours. The neighbors continued to drive it back until it disappeared into the darkness from which it had emerged. We huddled together near that cliff, only now realizing how many lives had been lost in those harrowing days. Our lives changed that night as we grieved beloved friends like Eldritch. Although Elk Ridge would never be quite what it once was, we had survived. As days melted back into weeks, peace seemed to return, although the killing of the creature remained shrouded in mystery. And while we may never know what that beast was nor why it terrorized us in such a gruesome manner, it's now just a chilling memory of a brutal chapter in Elk Ridge history, one that none who faced it could ever forget.